Buenas tardes, everyone. My name is Carlos, and we are we will be beginning the immigration hearing today. My name is Carlos Manchac, I'm the chair of the Immigration Committee. Today, the Committee on Immigration will be hearing intro 1706 in relation to prohibiting a smart chip from being added to the New York City Identity Card, IDNYC. At the onset of today's hearing, I want to I want to make clear that this legislation is the result of many hours of thoughtful deliberation and many, many meetings with advocates and representatives of multiple mayoral agencies. I do not take today's hearing lightly, and in many ways, I am disappointed that it has come to this point. On February 12, 2019, this committee held a hearing to celebrate the success of IDNYC program. Birthed from a community-voiced need and a community-led effort, for government-issued identification and championed by a diverse coalition of advocates, New York City Council proudly passed IDNYC legislation, Local Law 35 of 2014. Without the Herculean effort of the mayor's office, we could not possibly have seen a January 20, uh, sorry, January 2nd, 2015 rollout. And today the program has over 1.3 million cardholders. That's incredibly impressive. And that alone should be celebrated. And I want in this space to do that, that that is worth celebrating. And we're in the midst of celebrating that success. IDNYC literally opens doors. It grants access to city services that are difficult or impossible to access without identification. The card itself is secure. The city must purge all personally identifiable information after the cardholder's application is approved. As a result, it is, trust, is, a, it is a trusted program throughout the entire city. In May of 2018, the mayor's office released a request for information, an RFI. For the first time, the idea of adding a smart chip and payment application was made public. On December, in December of 2018, the mayor's office began the process of a negotiated acquisition for a smart chip that could be integrated with IDNYC. My office and the committee staff have been in monthly, sometimes weekly, conversations with the mayor's office and advocates since then to better understand the parameters of this proposal. After many months, I have come to the understanding that the risks associated with the mayor's proposal are too great. By partnering with a financial entity to execute their proposal, the city would subject IDNYC cardholders to a set of privacy standards outside the city's control. The city would necessarily risk the exposure of private cardholder information to subpoena and data sharing among private entities. In fact, the administration has publicly touted ways in which this very proposal, IDNYC with a smart chip, could facilitate data collection and data sharing. After years of advocacy, the city finally listened to our most vulnerable residents in creating a secure city ID that develops a bridge of trust between communities and government. A bridge of trust between communities and government and brings vulnerable populations out of the shadows. In one fell swoop, the mayor's office would undermine that trust, the very essence of the program. Be assured, this proposal is not about serving the unbanked and underbanked. There are better, safer ways to do that. This proposal is about giving a corporation a captive audience, 1.3 plus million cardholders, whose data is incredibly valuable to the private sector. And I cannot in good conscience watch from the sidelines as this program is dismantled. With that, I want to thank the staff who have made this issue a priority for us here at the City Council for many, many months and helped plan this hearing. Committee Council, Arbani Auja, Committee Policy Analyst, Elizabeth Cronk, and my Chief of Staff, uh, Lorena Lucero, Communications Director, Tony Chirito, uh, and the rest of the Immigration Committee staff. I want to thank the members of the committee who are here right now, uh, 
Councilmember Matthew Eugene from Brooklyn. And with that, I want to call the first panel a public panel that will kind of set us off in motion to discuss the topic at hand. And the first panel will be the Immigration Defense Project, Mizui Aziki, uh, the New Economy Project, De Del Rio, Nyklu, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan S. Us, the New York Immigration Coalition, Betsy Plum, and Natalia Aristo Saval from the Make the Road, New York. Please come up to the front and you can kick us off with your panel. Hello, well, and welcome. Who would like to go first? Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Betsy Plum, and I am the Vice President of Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. Thank you to the members of the City Council, the Immigration Committee, and Chairman Chaka for convening this important hearing on IDNYC and for the introduction of legislation, Intro 1706, that would prohibit a smart chip on IDNYC cards. We fully support this legislation and feel that the addition of a smart chip would jeopardize the integrity of the IDNYC card and program and the safety of the people who use it and most rely on it. Since its inception in 2015, IDNYC has been a vital and well-received tool, especially for immigrant and other New Yorkers who have traditionally faced obstacles to securing a government-issued form of identification. The card has helped individuals prove their identity at hospitals and government buildings, help parents enter their child's school, and helped hardworking New Yorkers open bank and credit union accounts to protect their earnings. Barrier after barrier has been overcome to create a more inclusive and welcoming city. Much of IDNYC's success came from its roots in community organizing and listening clearly to what communities and advocates were calling for to ensure the safest and most inclusive program. The proposed changes to the IDNYC program at the heart of today's hearing go far beyond IDNYC's original intent of providing safe, government-issued photo identification to New Yorkers who face barriers to securing other forms of government-issued ID. In fact, it runs completely contrary to that initial goal of the program. It effectively creates a re-envisioned program that sacrifices the safety and security of the cold card holders who most rely on the IDNYC program and trades that security for potential new benefits that would be best delivered by a completely different program, particularly a progressive one. The most important principle of the program, that the benefits always far outweigh the risks, is lost. And that trust and partnership that you mentioned, Chair, built between advocates, communities, and the city is seriously threatened. Embedding quote unquote smart chips into IDNYC cards is a dangerous and ill advised solution. There is a reason that no other municipal or state ID program has implemented this type and kind of technology and broad integration that the mayor's office is currently exploring. And it has nothing to do with it being, with there being a lack of innovative initiative and progressive will in these other places, but because of the fact that the risks are too high. Any solution, including payment cards the city may wish to develop, should not be connected to IDNYC cards. This should be common sense and is why we support Intro 1706. And while we do not support the integration of a smart chip into IDNYC cards, we do want to work alongside our municipal leaders to continue to think progressively around solutions to various issues that they are proposing to use IDNYC to attempt to address. We want to work with the city the MTA and the state, who is ultimately responsible for the MTA, to ensure that all New Yorkers have access to our vital public transportation system as the MTA transitions from the MetroCard system to a contactless system. We are especially eager to work with leaders to find solutions around expanding financial access and empowerment. However, finding a one-size-fits-all solution via the IDNYC program to these issues is unacceptable and dangerous. 
Our immigrant communities have been left beaten and bruised by rampant immigration enforcement and one of the most hostile federal environments in the history of our country. Parents, children, spouses, and friends are left reeling after the de deportation of a loved one, the detention of another, an unlawful home raid, and the fear that entire lives and dreams will be shattered in an instant. We must acknowledge those fears of immigrant communities and work together to break them down and build back trust. It is not time to dangerously play with a program that has been an incredible asset to over 1.2 million New Yorkers. Privacy and trust must be maintained. Our desire to uphold these principles, especially privacy, is not driven by paranoia, though we are right to be so, but by the actual harsh reality that we're living in and that immigrants must navigate daily. Thank you, and we look forward to continuing to work with City Council and the Mayor's Office to expand access and opportunity to all New Yorkers while enshrining the integrity and safety of the IDNYC program. We hope that the City Council will move Intro 1706 to a full vote and are grateful to the City Council for protecting the IDNYC program and immigrant New Yorkers. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Councilmember Manchaca um, and the rest of the council members present here today for holding this um, hearing, which is very important for us. So my name is Natalia Aristizabal Betancourt, and I'm here with Make the Road New York. I'm the co-director of organizing um, of our team. And Make the Road New York is a community-based organization with 23,000 members dedicated to building the power of immigrant and working class communities in New York to achieve dignity, justice through organizing, policy, innovation, transformative education and survival services. Um, we operate, it's particularly in this context, in um, three of the uh, counties of New York City. And we're here because we're really concerned about the IDNYC. Um, we as a community organization were part of the um, initial group that brought together this idea because we understood um, and because we work along signs of immigrants and that they needed an ID that was uh, reasonable and accessible to them. We're very proud of the outcome um, of our work, not only from our organization, but with our partners. Um, and we currently tell everyone to enroll and to get the ID. Our experience working with our members has demonstrated that this program is successful um, because, and even so, we were able to have them enroll in our offices. So our offices for a while were enrollment centers um, in Brooklyn and Queens. And um, for many of our members, this is the main source of identification, and for some other Folks like myself, we've been able to go to museums and be members of museums or public parks that probably we had not done so if it wasn't because of the perks of the ID. Um, and so we're really concerned um, because we think that this takes the, the identification to another, to another place. Um, when the community members come asking us for guidance about the ID NYC, we tell them that even though they have to submit documentation and they're gonna get on this initial database, that all the documents that they're gonna hand in to prove who they are and their address won't be stored. And we have fought really hard to keep ID NYC as safe as possible. For someone who resides in the city as an undocumented person, it's less risky to get an ID NYC than to walk around with their home passport or a matricula consular or consular ID, um, which some, some, council, some embassies from different countries will provide them. So our conversations usually where our members are simple and even joyful. Get the ID, um, it is safe, it's a great initiative, and you don't have to worry about signing up. It's a pretty simple and good conversation. Um, and this allows many of our members to have things that a lot of other people who currently have different forms of ID don't have to question, which is um, how to get to security when visiting their skid school for teacher, uh, parent-teacher night, or how to get into a building that won't let them in without identification. Um, as an advocate for the immigrant community, and more specifically for undocumented people who live in heightened fear during this particular challenging time, we need to protect the private information, um, and that's our main concern. And it is our job to, to foresee it to think the worst case scenario. And the federal administration has been showing us that our worst fears can come true. Um, we have attended numerous meetings uh, led by the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and have talked about this some of us for a year, some of us longer, and we haven't really heard the answers to our concerns. 
we basically, and it's simple, we don't want third parties having our information. We don't want the possibility of being tracked or surveilled when we take the subway. We don't want to further create databases with this program. We don't want opt-in options. Um, we know that surveillance, data storage, or tracking happens already in a lot of ways in our lives, but this right now, it's not happening due to the ID or to IDNYC, and we wanna keep it that way. We understand that Moya wants to help banking investors and bring more benefits to New Yorker, and while we commend this thinking, we don't think that a chip or contactless technology is the way um, is the way to do it. And we also understand that they wanna address the problem of why there is a lack of banking in low-income communities, poor, or communities of color, but having the chip and the contactless is not gonna actually address the root problems of that, and other colleagues here will um, address that better. Um, we do want the city to look into expanding the perks and who signs on to the ID and want it to be as successfully as possible without jeopardizing right now a program that works really well. And here's also a really, I think, important point for us and our members is that in a moment where there's so much distrust in government in general, the IDNYC has shown us that good policies can have um, good impacts in community members when there's programs that are made thinking about them. And this right now is actually a way that um, the community members can trust at least local government because of this program. Like, it works really well. And in a time when there's so much mistrust between individuals and government, mainly because of the federal government, um, we need to preserve any good interactions and relationships there, there is from civ like civilians or individuals to local government. So we thank you for the time for convening this. Um, and we are happy to continue conversations that include our concerns. Um, and that is thinking about perks and expansions without putting at stake so much for different IDs, IDNYC holders. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, council members all, uh, and, and uh, Carlos Manchaca for having this hearing. Uh, my name is Jonathan Stribling Us. I'm from NYCLU, uh, the New York Civil Liberties Union. We're an organization with about 180,000 members and supporters here in New York State um, from across the state. Um, and we are here to really say that we do support uh, intro uh, 1706, the bill introduced by uh, Councilmember Menchaca, um, because it really emphasizes the aspects of IDNYC that have made the uh, ID so successful with over um, a million, 1.3 million um, people signed up for it and using it currently, and an ID that really was designed and has continued to serve um, the most vulnerable population in our city and those folks that are most at risk um, and need the uh, most privacy protections um, from our city government. Uh, the IDNYC works, be uh, IDNYC works because it's something that um, it has community trust, and that trust is something that we and the other uh, coalition members here have been working with the city to build since 2014 when the bill was first uh, introduced. And we've gone through a number of different uh, findings along the way in terms of um, needing to change aspects of the bill to make it something that we could be uh, sure had robust privacy protections. Um, and this is adding to that. So this intro 1706 adds on the good aspects of um, the IDNYC bill and really make sure that um, we can uh, secure the documents and the um, identities of the individuals who are trusting the city to maintain those in the highest uh, way with the most security standards and privacy protections. Um, unfortunately, uh, financial tech is both at odds with the purpose of the card and the wishes of the cardholders. Um, and so adding uh, financial technology, which involves tracking transactions or allowing for contactless technology and smart cards into it, both of those things um, undermine uh, key aspects of the trust that has been built since 2014. Um, and it is something that, while well, Moya has said that they um, are trying to respond to the community uh, needs, and I, I respect the fact that the banking access is a very important thing that community members need, um, marrying an ID card and a, and a banking uh, card or a, or a payment card um, poses huge risks to privacy um, just by the fact that as you use a card um, more and more often, for transactions or for travel, it develops what's called metadata, where it develops more and more um, 
data surrounding uh, those transactions that can be used to individually identify an individual or um, give really detailed perspective into someone's uh, patterns of life which can be used to um, really hurt their privacy and, and undermine some of the protections that we really have fought for in IDNYC. Um, academic studies have consistently shown it takes only three pieces of known data to de-anonymize an individual, even in an anonymous data set. And so this is um, metadata, generally it refers to data about data. So it's where you used a card, the time, place, sequence, or timing um, of that use, and along with other transactions or other travel. And this is something that could allow advertising companies, government agencies to undo whatever um, pseudonymous numerical identifier would be used um, to, to um, hold the transaction or the, uh, the transit travel. Um, and it would allow um, those companies or those agencies to go back in time and get a really detailed picture of someone's usage of this card. Um, and the, the broader point here is really that um, financial technology no more belongs in a municipal ID than a MasterCard logo belongs on a driver's license. Right? These are separate functions. They should be kept separate. Um, we really want to increase uh, financial equity. We want to make sure that people have um, unbanked people are able to get access to credit and to um, a whole host of services that they d are in dire straits to, to require. However, um, you know, adding fintech to a government ID is not the proper way of uh, achieving those goals, as you uh, cited at the beginning of this. And I think um, the other thing to note here is that this type of metadata collection on a broad scale, when you're getting people's transit uh, travel or getting all of the um, transactions that they're uh, engaging in and tying it to their identity, um, can have uh, Fourth Amendment implications uh, under the Supreme Court's recent holding in Carpenter v. U.S. They say individuals have a privacy interest and a record of their physical movements. Um, and, and that's a strong statement from the Supreme Court, and we want to um, make sure that those that, that statement is something that the city is doing its best to, to maintain, especially in regards to an ID that really, um, at this point, has been useful as a shield for communities, and we don't want to turn that shield um, against communities into a weapon against them. Right? And that's what this, um, what adding tracking technology of any sort um, could really do. And so we want to honor the original purpose of the IDNYC and make sure it's successful in the coming years, avoiding risky either contactless RFID technology or tracking technology that is involved with financial technology in general, and make sure that we um, don't hurt individuals or undermine the city's uh, original purposes um, that were really wonderful in creating uh, what has been a successful IDNYC. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mizue Aizeki. I'm the Deputy Director of the Immigrant Defense Project. I want to start also by thanking uh, Chair, Ca Chair Carlos Machaca and the other council members for listening to us today. We were here uh, last February, right? Um, and we basically said the same thing. So I'm not going to spend my time reiterating that. Um, but I also just want to emphasize Oh, I'm supposed to say what IDP does, sorry. Uh, the Immigrant Defense Project uh, is a New York-based nonprofit that works to secure fairness and justice for immigrants by focusing on the rights of those caught at the intersection of the criminal justice and immigration system. So, you know, with that, we are extremely focused on the risks that immigrants face from surveillance. Um, as we know, when all of us here fought for the first IDNYC, um, as you mentioned, council member, the privacy and security were at the forefront of that, because even at that time we knew that uh, this population of people who would be the most in need of a government issued ID from New York City would be you know, a perfect uh, database or collection of people that could be targeted by police and by, or by immigration and customs enforcement. And I remember the first meeting I had with uh, Moya um, right after Trump won, and it was basically about the city telling us about the risk of a potential lawsuit, right, to have the city make the documents that they had stored foilable, and we were really scared, right? And uh, luckily, we won that fight, but we're just here to say, like, let's not make the same mistake again. Um, or a similar mistake. And so, you know, the admit, we've been talking about this or having conversations about this for a year with the administration, and, you know, it seems to us that now they're landing on the primary features of this 
proposal is to enable the ID card to be used at the MTA system as a contactless system and then also as a method of financial inclusion for uh, New Yorkers. And I think we all just want to stress to be really clear, we, both, we think both of those things are really important for people to have equal and efficient access to public transportation and also to really think about how to have economic justice and financial inclusion in New York City. And I just want to reiterate uh, the reason why we're here in support of this bill is because the, adding this to the IDNYC clearly is not the solution. Um, and so we had been mentioning, um, a number of people mentioned here, we've asked a lot of questions that haven't been answered yet, so I don't need to go into that. And I think uh, Jonathan from NYCLU talked about a lot of the surveillance risks, so I just want to hone in maybe on a couple things that are different. Um, you know, in terms of the role of data collection and ICE surveillance, one of the things that we've learned over the past three, two and a half years of this administration is that it's become what ICE calls mission-centric to have this kind of data and be able to analyze it, right? And so companies like Palantir play a big role in helping ICE, you know, amass all this data, analyze it in order to target people. Um, and also we've been learning as we learned about this proposal that data collection is also central to corporations in their efforts to make profits off of people's information. So I'll get to that more in a minute. But I think that you know, the point I want to emphasize here is combining that risk, the, the need and interest in data by you know, policing agencies like ICE, and then the interest, the centrality of data, right, and the profit model for uh, financial technology systems is really at the heart of like of, of our major concern with merging these two things. Um, and, you know, we've consulted with many of us with many different privacy and security experts, and I haven't encountered a single one, honestly, that has told me this is a good idea, right? And we're happy to provide you the names of all those people. And just to add a little bit more to what uh, Jonathan had mentioned, you know, I think one of the things that's become really clear in terms of merging IDs, identification with um, integrating different sources is what they call function creep, right? So it kind of starts out like, well, we're going to use this ID and I'll have some financial option. Then it becomes like, well, now you need this ID, we're going to put all your medical records on it. And then now if you're going to get your social security benefits, you have to get this card, right? So, you know, there are examples across the world globally where this has happened, uh, where now people are trying to kind of reel, reel this back in and stop this forward momentum. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we've really struggled with in terms of having like an open and transparent conversation about this with the administration is that it's constantly presented to us that this is a proposal that's coming out of the community, right? That this is something that community polls show this is what ID NYC cardholders want, which is definitely in conflict with how we understand what the community wants. But the purpose is always put out there that this is about improving the lives of New Yorkers, right? Yet at the same time, like if you read the financial news, it's no secret that major corporations like MasterCard also have made very clear that this is the type of proposal that fuels their business strategy, right? They talk about financial inclusion as a fundamental component. They talk about moving from a cashless society because cash is inefficient. They talk about we need to get a MasterCard in the hand of every poor person, right? And so, and you know, the former chief technology officer of New York City, who, who set up the agency that issued the RFEI now works for this type of initiative in MasterCard, right? So it's like this is all in the news, but this never surfaces in any of our conversations with the city. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, just on the example of Mexico City, there's a really great promo, promo video by MasterCard, or it's on Bloomberg, um, where they talk about why is this so important to them as a business model. And they're like, it's a big urban area, right? Millions and millions of people. Most of them are poor. Most of them, it's a huge cash economy. If we get a credit card in all of their hands to use the metro, which they're all using, then they're going to start using that card at the restaurant. Then they're going to start using it at the, you know, when they buy their vegetables and that kind of thing. They're very explicit about that. It, there's, it's not hidden. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, I have also attached to my testimony a study which shows how that, the, their initiative that they did in Mexico with the metro system has been riddled with all sorts of problems, right? People have had their, their assets frozen. The customer service is terrible. Um, I read somewhere that the interest rate is 97 percent. So if you borrow 10,000 pesos, you have to pay, what, 9,700 extra on top of that. And so I just want to, for us then from sitting here in this position when we're hearing, hearing 
you know, that this is all about financial inclusion. We just keep asking how, why? And we're told that we can't really tell you because it's procurement rules, it's exploratory, right? But so we have to go to the news and figure out what's happening. Um, I also just want to like emphasize the point about da how data collection is a really big part of their model. Um, Micro MasterCard also led a collaboration with Microsoft called City Possible, where they talk about compiling huge amounts of data as part of their model. 160 million transactions every hour all over the world, and, and this is going to give us insight on how people move and interact in a city space. Um, so. I just come here today just to say like we've received a lot of conflicting information. Like thank you very much for continuing to open the space for us to get clear about this. Uh, there's been a lot of lack of transparency. There's been like mixed messages and misinformation. Um, and it appears to me that there's an evident corporate, as you mentioned, corporate motivation for this pathway. Um, and that's kind of at the heart of this community concern about it is because that's never been surfaced or held up at, as the center of what this is. And that's not the path forward for economic justice and security for New Yorkers. Um, you know, I just want to say that Chicago also similarly put a, a, a MasterCard chip or some kind of chip on their municipal ID. Um, and they, a, a, they have continue to have a separate option for people to ride the metro without it being attached to their ID because they're very clear of the data risks for people um, in, in terms of having that on their ID. So if you wanted to speak to people in the city, you can speak to that. I think that it's just something that's a principle that other cities have also held, that maximum protections requires disaggregating IDs from this kind of chip. Um, so just to wrap up, Let's see. Just reinforcing this point that there is no other government-issued ID that offers the same level of protection as the IDNYC does currently, and we uh, feel extremely committed to that as a model uh, for um, New Yorkers and especially people who are at, at risk, uh, particularly at risk of surveillance and targeting. Um, and we also then ask the city, we're asking in support of this bill to close the chapter on this conversation about this IDNYC becoming a vehicle for financial inclusion. You know, we've been, uh, all of us are extremely busy, as you may know, the president doesn't like the people that we fight for, um, and it's, it's been incredibly challenging, I think, for all of us. We really appreciate the space to just to continue to say the same things over and over again. Uh, when so many of us have invested so many resources in promoting the IDNYC in the first place. Um, and then also, you know, on this piece of economic justice, like every single one of us is committed to that as a principle of our work. We know there's no gonna, not going to be liberation unless there's economic equality as a foundation. And some people have more specialty in it than the rest of us, but I just feel like, you know, our propose, uh, our hope is that we can close this conversation on the IDNYC with a chip and move forward uh, to a very like robust conversation uh, with stakeholders in the administration on how to really to find you know, financial equity and economic justice for New York. That's it. Thank you for that. And I just want to offer, not offer, but um, let you all know that Councilmember Danny Drum, Councilmember Moya, Councilmember Chin are also here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, committee chair Menchaca and members of the committee, and thank you uh, for holding this hearing and for shining a light on the issues that, and the risks that are inherent in this proposal by the administration. Uh, my name is Deyanira Del Rio. I'm the co-director of New Economy Project. We're a citywide organization that works in partnership with community-based groups and low-income New Yorkers to fight for economic justice, to challenge economic discrimination, and to build a just economy that works for all. Our opposition to this IDNYC smart chip is rooted in our almost 25 years of work in the city to address bank redlining, to combat predatory lending and secure some of the strongest state laws in the country that guard against predatory lending, that have kept payday lending and other forms of abuse out of the state. Um, we have a legal project through which we've worked with thousands of low-income New Yorkers to make them aware of their rights and to fight back against problematic practices by fintech companies, prepaid card companies, the banks, 
um, and many other actors, debt collectors and so on. We've brought impact litigation through which we've learned quite a bit about some of these companies' practices and tactics. And we just have a whole range of experience that we're bringing to the table um, to oppose this and we hope that we can bring that expertise and the relationships and partnerships and coalitions that we've built to the table to move forward and construct some affirmative solutions to challenges um, that have been identified in, through this uh, exploration. Um, so like other groups today, uh, that here today, we've also been part of these series of meetings with the administration, with city council, with other advocates and experts. Um, we've detailed at great risk, the, uh, um, at great length, the risks associated with this proposal and the reasons why we're opposed. Um, I am resubmitting testimony from the February hearing as well as memos and sign-on letters and questions that our organizations have jointly submitted to the administration um, because I think it's important that you all see that we have been operating in good faith, trying to articulate our concerns, trying to get answers to really important questions so that we can drill down to really understand the nuance of the risks. Um, with limited success. And we're here today also hopeful, also a little surprised that it's reached this point and hopeful that we can move forward in a positive way together as a united front of advocates, community groups, city council and administration um, because the, the stakes are that high and we need everyone's engagement. Um, so I just want to focus with, uh, on a couple of points related to this uh, administration's stated goal of promoting financial inclusion through embedding a financial technology smart chip into the IDNYC cards. Um, we, in addition to all of the dangers and risks and problems that you've heard that others have so effectively detailed, um, we just want to say that the fundamentally embedding a chip in the IDNYC card does not expand banking access at all. Um, the companies that would be providing that chip, as we understand it, would likely not be a bank at all, but rather a fintech or other sort of company. Um, and if it is a bank, there are real questions about why a bank would not open an account for people using IDNYC, but would allow this sort of secondary chip service um, on the IDNYC cards. And in fact, um, we believe that this plan would lower the bar in terms of New York's approach to date to financial access to consumer protection and fair lending. And I'll, I'll detail a few of these things. Um, so first of all, we feel like the, um, some of the stated benefits that this chip would provide are uh, a little out of touch with uh, the local landscape and the realities here in New York. So as an example, we have heard that um, the, one of the reasons we need to provide a chip option to people on IDNYC is because we need to give people alternatives to predatory lending, to triple-digit in, triple interest rate payday loans, et cetera. So first of all, the administration has said that credit will not be provided through the card, so I don't understand how this would provide an alternative to predatory loans. But more importantly, we do not have triple-digit interest rate loans in New York. We have some of the strongest fair lending and consumer protections in the country here in New York um, that have prevented payday and other kinds of exploitative lending from targeting New Yorkers. We have, most notably, um, a 25% criminal usury cap uh, that prevents lenders from charging more than that amount. It becomes criminal usury after that. Um, and so these are just, that's one example of just some fundamental kind of knowledge of the local landscape that we believe the architects of this you know, should, be, should understand, as well as the whole range of other consumer protections that are relevant in terms of this uh, envisioned service. Um, it related to that fintech companies are among those that annually uh, trek up to Albany lobbying uh, directly or through their trade associations to carve holes in our usury cap so that they can innovate and they can have an exemption and a nice carve out from our law so they can offer higher interest rate loans to people under the guise of expanding loans and expanding credit to people that the banks aren't serving. So while we agree with the premise that banks are not doing what they should be doing to serve New Yorkers and their neighborhoods equitably, we do not believe these are the solutions that policy making should be weakening standards in order to expand investments. And when we get to, a, hopefully we can have time to discuss affirmative approaches, there are many ways the city and state can expand and build on nonprofit, community-based, cooperatively owned institutions that are doing 
constructive, affirmative lending in their neighborhoods that is regulated, that is capped in terms of interest rates, that is directly meeting the needs that are articulated by people themselves, rather than needs that a, a, a company, a corporation has identified um, as they're going to provide and sort of creating that need itself for its own profit. Um, finally, groups here are working toward really progressive solutions to financial and economic inequality. There are coalitions of groups working to create public banks across New York City and state. Groups are working to scale up cooperatives, financial cooperatives that put ownership of these financial institutions in the hands of communities of color, of low-income and immigrant neighborhoods that have been marginalized by banks. So there is much that could be done to address these problems that doesn't rely on an industry-driven uh, approach. Um, Secondarily, uh, uh, there, we believe that this proposal represents dangerous experimentation. You've heard about the risks with experimenting, with linking to an ID card. Um, these are not actually abstract or um, new solutions. This, these have been attempted in many other cases, and it's worth noting. Um, similar proposal, a similar um, effort was attempted by Oakland, California, when it rolled out its municipal ID card. It partnered with a company to have a prepaid card option on that card, and it promised economic access and inclusion. It did not deliver. It was riddled with high fees and problems for people not being able to access their money. Oakland no longer offers that. New York City, at different points, has offered um, through the Summer Youth Employment Program access to bank accounts or access to a prepaid card. We heard from many of the workers at, the, at that time that they were unable to withdraw their wages from the cards. They had trouble taking anything less than $20 off, and so they were very upset that they weren't able to get their money. They didn't know where to, who to call and where to go to get assistance. Um, there are international examples that Mizue and others can talk about. There was a worker center prepaid debit card pilot that was attempted years ago, funded by Ford and other foundations, that was attempting to give worker centers and unions an ability to automatically deduct dues from its members. And what that card ended up doing after much money and investment and research and promotion was put into it was it ended up leading to people, again, paying high fees to conduct basic transactions, loading money, spending their money, swiping their money, and the company eventually pulled out of that business completely. Um, and there's many more. So we've asked um, the administration, among our many questions, what are the positive examples, the proven examples that, not what the company is telling you, but what are the examples that are inspiring and informing this exploration? And we have not received uh, real, detailed, concrete information about that. We've been told there are models in uh, other countries, and we don't think that that is sufficient. It's a different context, different regulatory environment, et cetera. Finally, uh, we believe that it's really important that if the city is going to be putting its resources, its name, its, uh, you know, its, its reputation behind an entity, behind a financial inclusion approach, that it should be what New Yorkers have asked for, what they have articulated for themselves as their needs. Um, and the city's own uh, materials about IDNYC cardholders has made extremely clear to us that uh, they want access to banks and credit unions. They want the IDNYC card to be accepted by a broader range of institutions. That is not the same as putting a chip on and raising all of these other risks and concerns. Um, we've heard the administration say that they're required by the enabling legislation to pursue this route. Um, our reading of the law is that it, it requires the city to encourage institutions to accept it, including banks and credit unions. That, again, is not the same as partnering with a financial company, whether a bank or fintech, to embed a chip in the card. This is an approach that is not tested and is dangerous. Um, and finally, um, I think that the reputational risk to New York City is great. So in addition to jeopardizing the trust and confidence that people have right now in IDNYC, um, you know, I think it's really a, a dangerous move for the city itself to be steering people, which is what it effectively would be doing, to a company with this untested program. When things go wrong, as they inevitably will, people are not going to understand that this is not the city of New York, that this is actually this other company. 
um, they are not going to understand that the protections that they have been so well educated about on the privacy and security of their data don't apply to this optional feature. We have not been able to get clear, concrete answers to so many of our questions. We don't see how the average New Yorker will be informed by the administration of the myriad unknown risks and uh, related to this ex experimentation. So thank you so much, and we look forward to further conversation. Thank you uh, for for your testimony and the rest of the testimony that was given here today. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to ask one question, then hand it over to Councilmember Drum, who was also a architect, a chief architect, working with the community to build this card. And so I want to make sure that he gets his question. But really, my first question, uh, Ms. Del Rio, and really the whole team here is you've presented incredible testimony that's filled with expertise and information. And how and when did you, in this process, get invited to share that information with the administration, very specifically before the R RFI came out? Were you invited to the table to discuss these issues with the administration before the RFI came out? And maybe that's a question for everyone. I will say that when I when we were part of the coalition that originally helped to create and promote IDNYC in 2015, at that point, this idea, a very similar idea, was floated by some in the administration, and the coalition was informed and in, engaged and was unified in saying this should not be branded. The IDNYC card for undocumented, for homeless, for vulnerable New York should not be co-branded with a company. It should not include this feature, which is, an, at that point especially, the, the protections that apply to those kinds of cards were even weaker than they are today. We successfully pushed back and were listened to. I think there was an understanding at that point that we, there needed to be buy-in of groups in order um, to get the ID sort of used and, and to encourage people to apply for it. This time around, we found out about this, ex this exploration after the RFI was issued, when someone notified us about that and we looked, at, we, you know, looked it up, we read about it. Betsy and I reached out immediately and had a conversation with Moya and others in the administration um, and hence kicked off this long um, series of conversations, although I will say with many months of gaps in between. Um, and so, no, we were not meaningfully consulted in this before this RFI was issued at all. Okay, and that's across the board here? Yeah. None of you were invited pre-RFI to inform the RFI. RFI goes out, and that's when you first engage the con in the conversation of a, of a smart chip. Correct. Okay. I just want to add to that that, um, yes, we found out to actually the, uh, but we were invited in the past for conversations about the possible expansion that included um, lowering the age of who had the ID, like for example, to giving the ID to middle schools um, because they don't have their own school ID. So there was sort of conversations that I believe we per took like maybe a year ago. I don't remember the, the timeline, definitely before this, but none of those meetings or at least those conversations at that moment talked about um, the expansion, like the banking expansion of the ID that only came afterwards after they uh, brought, brought it to our attention. Got it. So I just want to get that clear. The conversations that were happening with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs about expanding uses of the card never mentioned the chip, but it mentioned other things like lowering age and other things, but never the, the chip itself. Post that original early on conversations that were met with a lot of resistance and the understanding at that point was that they weren't even going to touch it. And then here comes RFI. Okay, I have a lot more questions, but I want to give it to uh, Councilmember Drum. Thank you very much. Um, good to hear from all of you. Um, I remember that uh, during the negotiations for the ID NYC, um, the administration also said that they wanted to keep the card pure, and for that reason, they didn't want to um, have any credit card companies coming in. Um, and uh, I think we all agreed on that at that time. Um, but uh, here's my question. So uh, um, the opposition to this um, is based primarily, from what I'm hearing, on security reasons about uh, name, address, uh, identification for card holders, is from what I'm hearing. And there are other concerns about the financial institutions as well. But we have been telling people to bank, and those same institutions have a chip on their card. 
So if, if they have a chip and our immigrant communities are carrying those, usually in the same wallet or whatever, I don't understand the difference between urging them to bank with it, and then they have a chip on that card, so that's gonna go everywhere with them too. So can somebody just tell me what, what, how, what that is, looks like or what it's about? Um, thank you for your question. It's definitely a, a very good one and, and one that has come up a lot. Um, it, when you marry um, a ID card with a financial card, um, it actually creates a lot more data and there's a, because there's a lot more points of contact where you would either use an ID or um, a financial card, whether that's to do, you know, buy something at the store or whether that's to get on the train. Um, that means that there's a lot more data generated, which actually, um, especially for the companies, the third parties that would be maintaining most of that data, they have um, a much more detailed picture of what an individual might be doing during a day and can get access to, to data that would otherwise they wouldn't get just from the usage of the ID itself. Um, also, when someone is signing up for a bank, right, um, they're making a decision that they that the bank is going to know information about the, the transactions that they're making, right? That's how banks work. We understand that. That's a different question than when someone is signing up for an IDNYC, which is where um, we've, as as community members, as coalition, as the city, um, folks have said, this is an ID um, that's especially for but at still, I don't understand because the objective, part of the objective of IDNYC was to get people banked. Mm -hmm. So if we wanted to get people banked, they're going to, they're sending them to those banks outside of the banks that are currently working with us, and they may even be collecting that same information or sharing that same information we're still encouraging them to get banked and they're going to collect that information. So uh, th this is the question I have is that I just don't understand what the difference is. So if I may, I think one is that our, our, our regular debit card doesn't have our home address, for example. I'm sorry, would. I, Natalia, just that. Our debit cards currently don't have our home address. This will make it so that you have your home address and debit card all in one place, which actually makes it a more dangerous document to lose. But the actual to really answer your question is that when someone goes to open up a bank account, they need two forms of ID. The first piece here is that the administration told us that they were going to work with all banks so that it would, was taken as a primary source of ID, and currently it isn't, right? Like the big banks don't take it as a primary source of ID, they take it as a secondary one. So there's there some work to be Except done. Except for like amalgamated, right? But those are local um, or smaller banks. I'm talking about like Citibank, Bank of America, Chase. If I tell someone who's undocumented to go and open up that account, they actually need to take their home passport and then the ID is the secondary one. And actually adding a chip to the current ID doesn't solve to what you need to present to open up your bank account. And I think back to the yes point is they, it's not enough to be a primary source of ID when you're open up the bank account, but it would be enough then to put it on your chip when, with that same ID that you can open up a bank account. Like That doesn't make sense. But the basic point there is that the reasons why more people are not opening bank accounts, it's not the chip. It's whether the banks are in their neighborhood, whether they take the source of information, whether they need a social security number, and this chip doesn't solve any of those Root but it seems causes. almost like a roundabout way to force the banks to accept the ID um, for identification to open the bank account. And it seems like, in, to a certain extent, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but um, that we're trying to say to the banks, look, you don't accept the ID as identification, but you certainly want the business, so this is a way to get around that. And, um, and, and so, but there are some banks that are working with us on this, and I'm wondering if, if, if with a chip, at some point, let's just say, that doesn't provide all of the information that you have concerns about providing them with, would that be acceptable to um, our immigrant coalition? Can I just, I, I don't know if this totally answers your question, but what I do want to say is that you mentioned something about that this gives a possibility for the banks to now be able to open up more bank accounts and that the city can play a role in mitigating that, but the city is also playing a role in making our population a market and making our population then like get into these fees and all of it that the new economy project ex just explained and I just don't think that that should be the city role and I mentioned that in my testimony data is being collected we are being tracked the NSA is listening to a conversation
conversation right now, but the city is not mitigating that and is not the, the, the intermediary for those things to happen. If, this, if the idea is expanded, then that is the role that local government would be playing. Well, I personally would like to see the banks, I would personally like to see the city pull all of its accounts from banks that don't accept the IDNYC, personally, <laughs> but I don't know that that's going to happen. I've brought up these discussions with the administration in the past, and, um, but I still am not 100% there on those same people. We're, we're telling them to go to banks, and every bank today includes that chip. Well, just to be clear, some people have debit cards that are not contactless RFID. It's, they're not what? They're not the contactless RFID, which um, NYCLU can elaborate on those specific risks. My bank card, my credit union card, they don't have, they're chips that you have to insert. They can't be read from afar. So it's um, reading afar so is one, the, one of the problems. But the bigger, the bigger difference is that, again, the city is not steering someone to that. It is not endorsing an entity as its preferred partner, which is effectively what it would be doing. But also, the account and the debit card is not coupled with the identity card. It's completely different and separate. When the, someone's out and about, there's no way to detect what underlying documents the bank or the credit union accepted in order to open the account on which the card is then issued. So essentially also, what you're saying is that you want people to make the choice about whether or not they want to open a bank account. And be account. more protected by having that chip, their MasterCard, Visa, whatever it is, have it disconnected from their identity card, especially an identity card that is a target for ICE, for law enforcement, et cetera. The other piece is that the kind of institution it w could potentially be very different. Again, we don't know who the administration has been talking to, if it's a bank, if it's a fintech company. We've heard a lot about fintech, so we think it's maybe in that direction. A credit union or bank is, is governed and regulated by strong, uniform, federal regulations and consumer protections. FinTech means a lot of different things, but that industry as a whole right now is not as well regulated or understood by regulators. It is the subject of major um, enforcement actions right now, and the Trump administration is working actively to deregulate I understand that, that but we're, we're so telling people to go, institution. we're it's telling also, people to go to, to bank. Yeah. Right? So they're gonna have that information. And that's what I don't understand. Well, law enforcement can't just ask a bank or a credit union, give us all your information about undocumented people. First of all, the banks and credit unions sh should not be able but to they, even identify them. I'm sure that those them. banks probably there are, there provide that information even to, um, for sales purposes. I mean, for, you know, for marketing purposes. It, in certain to, cases, to other, yes. To other we're, we're not necessarily chiefly concerned with cross-marketing. We're concerned about broader surveillance and tracking that can happen by connecting that chip to the identity card. And also, if that chip provider is the one that's actually holding the data, which is not the case and it's holding people's underlying documents, which is not the case at a credit union. So there's some credit union folks also in the um, next panel, so maybe they can also explain it in a way that's um, more resonant. I also just want to say, like, if there was an elected official here in New York City from Staten Island, Malietakis, who fo like tried to get the data that this ID was getting because she ultimately wanted to hand it over to ICE. So we actually don't have to wait for the federal government. We just have to look for someone who's anti-immigrant who wants to run for office to make a statement, and then whatever data we're gathering can be foilable, and that's actually our fear. But we prevented that from happening with that assemblywoman. And it was so a lot of work. Could why legislation be written? That? I'm sorry, Natalia. It was a lot of work. Why would we go back to that? Well, we won that, so that's done. So, w would there be a way to write legislation similarly that would protect them, particularly with banks that are working with us already, like Amalgamated or like a, a credit union? Um, I mean, I think the the biggest question here is that. Individuals, when they sign up for an IDNYC, should um, solely get an IDNYC, and they shouldn't have to either decide to opt out or um, be forced into a, a smart chip card that has other implications that they may or may not be aware of. When you go to a bank, you're um, deciding on getting a bank account. When you go to the DMV, you're deciding on getting an ID um, that allows you to drive. Um, those are the choices that we want to give um, the most vulnerable communities among us and make sure that those choices are as clear as possible for people so that when they um, decide to sign up for a bank account, that's something that they can do 
you, but that they're not um, forced into a, a card. And some of the smart chips, depending on, uh, smart chip is a broad category, but when we're talking about um, RFID or radio frequency identification inside of a smart chip, which is when you have a contactless chip or contactless card, um, those can be read from a distance without the individuals who have the cards knowing that they're being read. So there's a lack of consent that can uh, develop around how those cards are being used and read and surveilled. And that's a much more severe concern that I, we don't I hear that, we know that there's ways you, to avoid. I bet you but, everybody mm -hmm. on this panel, when we were um, creating the legislation, was keeping in mind that one of the purposes of creating the IDNYC was to be able to enable people to bank. And what I still don't get is that if we're encouraging them to bank and the banks are going to have that information on the chip, Unless you're telling me that the, the, that solely keep it on, a, you know, an ID separate from, the, but still you're going to encourage them to bank. So, so the, the, it's the same end result. We don't always encourage them to bank. And actually, I work with immigrant community members, both documented and undocumented. And having access to a bank is in the least of their worries right now. Like if we're really going to think about Natalia, policies one of the best things that you can do when you're applying is, for immigration is to have bank records and to have tax records. Correct. Right? And the chip is not going to get to the issue of like needing to show your IDs that sometimes people don't have another form of ID besides ID NYC. It's actually not going to change the banking practices. And in the, in the realms of what I need to do with community members, I need to make sure that they know if ICE is coming to the doors what to do, that they're going to get legal screenings to see if they qualify for any benefits, that their kids are fine, that they are not a target to ICE. Opening up a bank account for someone who currently doesn't have it, it's not their priority right now. Uh, I'm going to do one follow-up yes. and then hang it over uh, or hand it over to Councilmember Chin. Uh, Councilmember Drum came up with a, I think, a, a really important thing that I just want to go back and, and offer an opportunity for clarification, and that really was was this concept of banking and connecting communities who are underbanked to to banking. And what Councilmember Drum is bringing up is, I think, an important piece that that. Banks are all are still going to have con information from from people who decide to go to banks, and what I see as a difference between banks is also, or there's a difference between banks and fintech, financial technology, which is different. And I think what's important for us because we're not the experts, right? So we're trying to get your expertise, which is why not just from the technology side, but from the community side. So this is why the, this first panel is is up to lay it out, but this is changing the game in terms of how we ask people to connect to banking solutions. Going to a bank is one thing, going to a FinTech option is another, and that they're different. And it's, it's important to note that we're asking, we're, we're asking the question about putting FinTech on this card. And so can you just point to that? Because I think Councilmember Drum has a good question in that, that we want people to go bank somehow. Five years ago when we put the card together, we thought Chase and Amalgamated. But now we're talking about a third option, which is FinTech, which is different. And that can maybe help us clarify what we're actually talking about here. And what is unknown for us right now is that the chip may go to Chase or it may go to FinTech. We don't know that right now. And we're going to talk to the administration a little bit about that. But that might help clarify that question. Yeah, Chase, please. I feel, is equally not so good, but um, if, or if is it? my question Help really us. was more that if there's a way to find an institution that we could trust to be able to do this is where I was heading with that, although I understand the other arguments that were presented. Okay, that's fair too. Please. Uh, just a couple of quick points. If someone wants to right now, they can take their IDNYC card, um, potentially, if this company accepts it, and open up their own separate prepaid, reloadable debit card, that will not be connected to the IDNYC card. And we're saying whatever you choose, a bank, a prepaid company, the check casher, disconnect it from the identity card that was created for vulnerable New Yorkers, and that is a target for law enforcement, including ICE. I also want to say New York State has passed driver license legislation, informed and 
fought for by immigrant communities, that should also go a long way towards securing acceptance at local banks that have been reluctant to accept IDNYC because they say if we accept it from IDNYC, from New York City, we have to take it from all the municipal IDs across the country. That said, we think, and we would love to work with you on this, we think the banks should be brought to the table to account for why they're discriminating against this form of ID, which is extremely secure. It's actually more secure and harder to get than some state driver licenses that the banks happily accept to open accounts. And so, you know, this now has a track record, this program of be operating successfully for five years. It has not been proven to be susceptible to fraud in any greater degree than any other identification card program. Program. It has been accepted successfully by 14 institutions, banks and credit unions alike. The banks should come to the table and explain why they are not now accepting this ID card when they take other forms of ID that are in fact less secure. And so to us, this is a form of discrimination that is a pattern and practice of the banks, discriminating against perceived high-risk populations like immigrants, and New York City should not just tolerate that. It should bring it to the table. It should bring its, the bank regulators to the table to counter the misconceptions that the banks um, promote as their excuses for not accepting it. So we are excited. We have a menu of ideas, including these, that we would like to work with the city on that we think will go far toward this, this stated goal of expanding banking and credit union access. Great. And we'll ask the administration that question. <laughs> Councilmember Chen. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to follow up. Like, we're spending a lot of time on this, but the major question is that how are we doing to expand IDNYC? Are we signing up everyone that should be signed up? Are we getting people to renew? I mean, that's coming up, right? So we got a lot of work to do, and then here we're talking about a chip. It's like, there is, I guess, my question to you is that there's not a lot of bank that do take NY, IDNYC to open an account, right? How many? 14. But there's a lot more banks in New York City. And there are community banks. So I think that we need to work on expanding that list, that every bank that does work, you know, that makes money in New York City, should be able to take this card and help people open accounts. I mean, we should be working on that versus a chip. I mean, it's like, okay, if you open an account and then they give you a debit card or you want to apply for a credit card, that's your choice. But if putting a chip in the, in the ID card, that really depart, you know, defeats the original purpose. We don't want people to feel like they're being tracked and you know, their identity is being watched or whatever. I mean, we did so much work <laughs> to ensure people that it's safe, it's good. I mean, I think we should be spending more time getting more cultural institution, because in the first year or two, I mean, the cultural institution that I know in my district, their membership expanded because of people with the IDNYC. We need to continue to do those things, and the administration should be working with you and the council to really expand the benefits and if we're talking about really helping people uh, who really need a bank account to open up, then we got to make sure we require all the banks that do business uh, in New York City, or at least the bank that the city put their money in, that they have to help open up accounts. So there's so much to work on. Instead, we're, we're like all of a sudden, they put out this REFI to distract this whole campaign. Because right now, our job is like, if we're talking about lowering the age, getting more people to sign up, don't waste our time. I mean, I hate to tell the administration, okay? You're just wasting people's time. We gotta make sure that everyone who have the card renew their card. And that is a campaign that I thought I heard the administration was trying to work with us on, but then I haven't heard anything afterwards. You know, we set up you know, pop-up sites and all that in the beginning to help people sign up. Now it's time to renew and to expand. I mean, this is a big job. So I think that on the council, we really need to work with you uh, to get the administration back to spend the time to do the right thing and really expand on this, on this important program. So I thank you, you know, for your testimony. And we'll definitely have to work together on this. Thank you. 
Just to say to that, that the other areas of Moya have been reaching out to us as Make Their Own New York to do community events to uh, encourage people to renew. And we haven't had those conversations because we're not going to have those conversations until we know what's happening with the expansion of the ID. Got it. That's important. And I just want to, because uh, the admin will be testifying next, the, ad the admin can kind of testify whether or not the chip concept was part of a way to expand services, and that will be up to them to figure out whether that's true or not. But that might be one of their ways to get more people to sign up. And um, and really, the one question I want to ask before I hand it over to Councilmember Miller from Queens is, um, and this is Natalia, what you just basically said: if their chip, if a chip lands on this card and becomes embedded, will this coalition and other organizations? You said in your testimony, but I think it's important to say, remove your support for the card and ask people not to join the card. Yeah, because we can't, based on our, our research, based on the work that this group here and the rest of the coalition have done, we don't, we can't say for fact that now having the ID with the new iterations and the expansion and all of that is going to be safe for everyone. So we will not only proactively stop promoting it, but we'll start telling people disenroll. And actually, our analysis is that a lot of people in New York City will stick with the ID versus the driver's license. But if, if this happens, then maybe people need to think about either the driver's license or state ID, um, because that doesn't have a chip and that doesn't put you additionally at risk. I want to be able to tell people in New York City, sign up for this ID, because I am really proud of this program. Like, I really, truly love it. Um, and that's what we want to continue to say. Yeah, just to echo Natalia, this ID has been amazing. Um, to Council Member Chin's point, we need to and want to be working with the city to really figure out how we can double down on renewals. Uh, communities need this ID more than ever right now and need it to be safe and secure and simple. And it would be an incredibly sad moment if a chip gets added to the IDNYC and we have to go back to at least the NYC's membership, which is about 175 organizations working with immigrant communities in New York City, and counsel them to either stop actively promoting the IDNYC program or to perhaps counsel against signing up for an IDNYC. I do not want us to be in that situation. We feel that the risks are too high right now, and this is why we have been in opposition to the IDNYC, smart chip integration. We don't want to be in that situation. We want to rebuild the trust with the city, and we want to find safe ways to expand this program and really encourage renewals. I hear that. I hear that. Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. So, so obviously there's a lot of conversation about technology use of technology and, and this chip being implemented. Um, I, I don't think, uh, and, and the chair just mentioned whether or not we had really in, in, uh, engaged the idea of the enhanced um, benefits of the card. And, and like everything else, we got to put it on the scale and see whether or not communities are being protected in a way that that was intended, but there's a lot of dynamics about the card and, and the benefits of the card. The initial ID, NYC, um, bringing access to folks who did not have access, and, and so without getting into the numbers of documented or undocumented folks who, who hold the card, um, I know that there are communities, communities of color, who did not have access to a lot of um, institutions throughout the city of New York that now have access, whether it was banking and a number of other things. So it just did not have traditional identification. So this certainly um, enhanced that access. But I also know that those same communities are vulnerable when it comes to um, predatory practices of, of, of institutions, financial institutions, and they have to be protected as well. Right, no one more vulnerable than those communities. What's the balance? And if, in fact, there is um, some technological concerns that we have, how do we make sure that they're not only mitigated, but that they are addressed and that they're just not happening? That if there is a significant benefit, that then why should our community not take a part of it? Why should we not say that um, 
we are deserving just as deserving and we need as equitable opportunity as everybody else and should that opportunity not be diminished based on lack of access to identification right because this is not a new phenomenon in in our communities it has happened forever and i think that idnyc was a great step in that direction and 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 you know, it, it, as Councilman said, it needs to be improved. But there are a plethora of ways that that can happen. Um, and, and just what kind of conversations are we having around security, technology, and the benefits, and whether or not um, those benefits never could outweigh security in, in this um, of, of the individuals, but secure security around financial documents certainly. And um, but what are we doing to protect the individuals? Are the individuals, the individuals, can they remain protected at the same time, um, have access to these improved benefits that this chip allegedly would, would, would bring forth? So I'm interested in, in hearing that myself, but I know that one, something that has been, that we've been spent decades looking at is the predatory practices that happen in communities of color. And, 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 and so whatever opportunity we get to shine lights on it, and honestly, to move them out of our community, then we should be, that should be a big part of it too. So it, anything that we can address, technology that we're looking at that may be acceptable, um, and then perhaps the other part is for the administration. I can start by just saying our organization has been working on this for uh, about 24 years. I've been in this field, um, at the organization and elsewhere for about 22 years myself. And I want to say that uh, this notion that technology is going to solve bank redlining and discrimination is not new. And there have been promises that um, this is what's going to happen, and they do not deliver. And so while this permutation of an identity card linked piece of financial technology is new, um, this is not a new concept. You see bank branches not only continuing to exist, but proliferating in affluent and predominantly white neighborhoods while they're closing down in communities of color, including middle income neighborhoods in Southeast Queens and elsewhere. We agree with you fully on the problem of banking access and how it is a something that contributes to broader economic inequality. Um, we don't think that the solution is exposing people to risks through the ID connection, through um, a fi fintech company that right now is a very uh, dangerous, let's just say, industry for the city to partner with. Um, we think that you know we're out in we're out in um, neighborhoods dozens of times a month doing community workshops, talking with community groups and their members. We have yet to have someone in a community say to us. I want a prepaid card or I want a chip in my community. Oh, they want bank branches, they want credit unions, they want access to not just a payment thing that they can use to swipe or a check casher. What we hear people want is actually what many of us take for granted, which is access to people that speak their language, uh, an institution they can walk into when they need assistance if they've been the victim of fraud, which is increasingly common. They want access to full range of services that they need. Um, you're going to hear from some community development financial institutions upcoming that are, have been created by people in neighborhoods of color and immigrant neighborhoods in response to bank redlining. They don't just offer people a card and a chip, which is pretty easy to do. They give people financial counseling, free tax preparation. They help them apply for tax ID numbers. They help them understand how to create a budget within their means. They help them tap into public benefits. They offer loans, remittances. So this kind of like one, you know, this like, okay, let's give people a card because it's better than nothing, we think is not what we hear people asking for, and we don't think it's the sound public policy approach that New York City should be taking to address these very critical problems that you are very correctly um, outlining. And finally, is, and, and just forgive my ignorance, is this kind of like enhanced driver's license? Can you opt in? Can you opt out? Is, 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 is the chip going online that does mean that everyone who has a card has to have a chip? Um, well, I mean, the, the current proposal in terms of the um, 
1706 is to make it so that a chip could not be put on the uh, IDNYC, which is what we're supporting. Um, I think that there, in the past, we've heard different things from the city. We don't have much in writing in terms of whether or not there is going to be an opt-in or opt-out or whatever the different proposals have been. Um, but one thing that uh, we were very concerned about and continue to be concerned about is the integration of uh, um, RFID or a, a contactless into the chip that is by default, into the card that is by default and can't be turned off. And so that's something that um, we have uh, significant concerns about and it provides uh, a lot less security for people because of the tracking risks involved with that. Would, would an opt-in or out be be a suitable? Um... I think that the um, the current um, 1706 is the best option in terms of making sure that we both. Jonathan, I'm going to pause you here. I, you guys need to answer this question: mm -hmm. opt-in, opt-out. Mm -hmm. What are the issues with that option? Um, opt-in, I mean, opt-out. In general, we support many, you know, as many options as possible for people. If people are being offered bank accounts or things like this, we do think that for vulnerable communities, it's great to have um, different options. However, um, the, we want the most robust privacy and security for these communities as well, both for the fraud risks and for the, um, the kind of risks of uh, tracking and, and surveillance tech. And so um, I think that in, in general, the opt-in option is not ideal for this situation. We, we much prefer um, just having a separate ID card that's different from your banking card. That's a more secure what option. What makes it not ideal? Um, because of the, the concerns around metadata that I was uh, referencing in the sense that as you use a bank card for more and more things, whether it's buying your groceries, whether it's going getting on the train, those transactions are being, um, you know, depending on the type of company you're, you're dealing with, if it's a fintech company, their main job is basically to sell those transactions to advertisers or to other banks or to other um, entities. And let's just be clear. We're talking about essentially every card will have a chip, mm -hmm. but you can opt in to turn it on, or are you saying that, that the option of having a card with no chip and there's a card with no chip? By the way, we don't even know that. We we'll ask the administration that, yeah. right? But let's look at the yeah. options here. A card... 2.0, ID NYC, yeah. ID NYC 2.0, mm -hmm. two cards come out, one without a chip and one with a chip. Yeah. Let's go there first. Yeah. What's your response to that? Um, we have significant concerns with that because of some of the things that um, Natalia was raising in the sense that to properly educate community members about the differences between that is, are very, is very difficult and takes a lot more energy and would have to be, uh, we'd have to offer, an, uh, or the community members have said, and I think we, we support this general perspective, that it's, um, they would have to do a lot more education for individuals before they recommended um, getting an IDNYC so that individuals could better understand the risks that they were opening themselves up to by having a car that had tracking embedded in it. If we have um, a card that has RFID in it, it can't be turned off. Right? There's different types of smart chips. So when people say smart chips, they're talking about a bunch of different things. But there's uh, a contact smart chip and a contact list smart chip. The contact smart chip conceivably um, could be turned off, but the contact list smart chip cannot be turned off. So that's the one we have the most concerns about. Um, if it's opt-in or opt-out, we think that regardless of that, you're going to be creating a huge amount of data that's tied to an ID um, that, that is something that we don't want individuals to have um, that, that, that data being um, grabbed up by these fintech companies or these banks in a way that makes it uh, all of their detailed information about how they're um, conducting their lives uh, be easily surveillable and, and would open them up to uh, actions from immigration or from other um, uh, entities that these vulnerable communities really need support in, from the city in, in protecting themselves against. So for those reasons, we think that um, we, uh, the 1706 is the correct approach in terms of making sure that there is isn't um, a, a confusing opt-in or out, op, uh, opt-out option that will ultimately make it harder for uh, community members to recommend these um, IDNYC to, to or community organizations to recommend this to community members. Can I add something? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, one ahead. quick thing. Um, I think we appreciate, we've heard a few different options from the city of what could happen moving forward. We appreciate the city trying to come up with a solution. I think in our own conversations, particularly with communities, um, with the coalition, there are three top line things. I think Jonathan touched on two of them. First, if we create separate cards, um, an opt-in, opt-out, there is no, we've crossed the Rubicon then. There's no guarantee that a future administration won't say, we really just like, this is excess. 
we need to consolidate down to one, and then we have this chipped card that we are all very worried about. The second piece is the risks still remain, and we really feel that those risks are universal, and so having an opt-in or opt-out doesn't solve that problem, and I think for my organization, and I would gander for Natalia's as well, that community education piece is perhaps the number one reason for us why this is problematic. Because we go back to the same problem. We would have to counsel the immigrant communities and the organizations that we work with that we do not feel it is secure to use that chipped option. And what you're really doing then is you're counseling against a part of the IDNYC program, and I think the amount of time that that takes, it's, I'm worried that it, that condenses down to, oh, someone just said not to sign up for the IDNYC program. I don't want to be in a situation where we're telling someone to not do something with the IDNYC program, because I think that really is understood and interpreted as there are problems with this program. When it, we could, with Intro 1706, maintain the program as it is and work as a broader city and community to solve these huge problems, particularly around banking, that we all agree on. We just do not see this as, we, we see this as an insufficient solution. Um. You know, I think Natalia made this point the other day, but do you want to make it about the two-tier card? Yeah. yeah. That's actually what I wanted to say. So, like, to put it in more simple terms, Betsy and I going to any place, they asked us for an ID. Betsy, for whatever reason, decided to do the opt-in, and she has the chip. I may not. You're on the other side. You're getting our IDs. That's already telling you a story. And there, there is a story about she can access banking or she wants to have banking, or there is a story about like, I don't want to access banking or I can access banking. It already creates a sort of two tier. And I think for, for folks who are our friends, fine, you decided not to have your chip, that's great. For folks who are looking at ways to profile us, and that happens a lot, and target us, and, and treat us differently, it's giving, it's giving us all sorts of information, and you could, I guess argue right now that if I have a driver's license or my municipal ID, if I use my municipal ID, people can already say like, well, why are you using this ID instead of your driver's license? I actually use the municipal ID in New York City all the time rather than my driver's license um, because I want to make a point about like, I'm with the city, I'm with this ID, I don't care if you think that I'm undocumented, but actually for someone who is undocumented saying like, I have the lower version of this ID, is telling a story that they should not be walking around with because there's other stories they already have that like define them without them even saying a word. Got it. Um, I have one more point that I wanted to add. You know, I think in terms of the community education piece, like how many people when you get that privacy notice, like Apple has changed the terms of privacy, actually reads it? I always get through like one paragraph and then I'm like, forget it. Like I want to get the app, right? And so this is I think a real concern when we think about like financial and you know, Day's the expert on this, but I think part of the problem is that we don't know what we're getting. And there, there is no example that we've been told where people are getting something and they're getting actual more financial security, right? Or they actually have some path to liberation for economic justice. What we hear is, I put my paycheck into this card, my money got frozen, I couldn't pay my rent, I got kicked out. I called this number, nobody answered, right? So it's like, these stories just abound everywhere. Walmart has that big, what's it called, green, green dot? dot? Same thing, you just Google it. Like this is what is happening to people. And I think part of the issue about the two tier thing is like uh, the security experts we talked to said this is, once you start doing things like that, you're whittling down in terms of surveillance a population that becomes much more marked, right? So do we all remember when this first ID came out? Everyone's like, everybody get an ID, right? So this doesn't become the ID of undocumented people or homeless people or people who want to choose their gender identity, right? It's the same idea. If you ask anybody who has a driver's license or has a bank, do you want a chip on your IDNYC? I haven't encountered a single person who was like, hell yeah, like that sounds great. You know, everyone's like, no. So then, then it's gonna whittle down that pool. Whoever's gonna have that chip is gonna be the people who, like Natalie's saying, oh, you can't get a bank account, huh? Like you must have some issue that's preventing you from having some other form of security. And so, that's one piece. The other piece, I just want to add this notion of function creep, which I think is really a real thing when it comes to technology, is, you know, right now the administration, somebody really wants this to happen, right? So then it's going to be like, okay, now we have this two-tiered system. The advocates are saying don't use that one with a chip on it, so let's make it 
really appealing to some community that has no other choice, right? If you're going to start accessing some kind of health care provided by the city, we can only provide it for you if you have this ID with a chip. If you're going to start accessing some other kind of benefit provided by the city, I'm not saying that this is part of the plan, but I'm just saying this is how things have played out historically. If you look at places like India and elsewhere, where all of a sudden, you know, there is an investment for the government to give people IDs and also to track them as well. And so, you know, I think part of this just to reinforce is like we're not making this stuff up. Like there's there's evidence for both kind of the fintech and the failures of that, how we need to push banks definitely. That's something that's clear. But there's nothing in here that strikes me as something as a pathway, like I said before, for some kind of equality. People are not going to leave poverty because they have this chip on their card. Like, let's not pretend that's what it is, right? And so can we enter into a serious conversation about, like, we've outlined all these risks. The benefits are still really fuzzy to us. You know, can we just keep it as it is? Because we all support it that way. Thank you. I, I we're going to move on to some more panels. There's a lot of folks that are here to, to continue the conversation. I think we, we've kind of set the tone for the discussion. And uh, at the request of the administration, uh, I'm agreeing to bring two members of the public uh, and organizations to talk a little bit about a different perspective on this card. And I've agreed to do that. And here's my last thing before you leave. A lot has been discussed. And really, my last question was revolving around this, this last topic, which is there are a lot of other ideas to move forward. Are you willing to continue to engage with us at the committee level, at city council, and the administration on solving this issue of banking? Because the things that we have all talked about, including Councilmember Miller, exist. There are barriers to access for financial services that we have to solve. Now, we're talking about one option, and we're going to have to make a decision about what that is. Will you continue to engage with us at the city level, mayor's office, and the council on solutions? Yes? Great. That's a yes from everybody. Uh, and I think that's it. And if you ha do you have solutions? I don't want them now, but do you have solutions that you're ready to talk about and put on the table? Yes. yes. Great. Sounds positive and productive. Thank you. Thank you. OK. So. We are having uh, Bishop Mitchell, Mitchell Taylor from Urban Upbound and Karen Ottoni from the Linux Foundation. Please come on up, and we'd like to hear from you before we hear from the administration. Hi, who, who would like to start? And when you do, make sure that the red light is on at the, at the microphone. Ladies first. OK, thank you. Um, hi, thank you for having me here today. It's been a very interesting discussion to listen to. Um, so my name is Karen Ottoni, and I'm the director of ecosystem at the Linux Foundation and work on the Hyperledger project there. Um, the Linux Foundation supports and promotes the development of open source technology um, and open source communities around the world. Hyperledger focuses specifically on building production grade blockchain technologies for business organizations and governments to be used in initiatives that seek to leverage distributed trust via a distributed network for business and societal value. There are many use cases where blockchain technology is applicable, but one of them that is being explored significantly is financial inclusion. The reason for this is that the barriers that exist here in the US and around the world, while they may vary in degree, are in many ways similar. Financial inclusion exists due to lack of access to services, a lack of verifiable cre credit history, um, predatory practices, and a lack of uh, formal identification. 
Initiatives that tackle these issues in a privacy-preserving, identity-enabling manner are gaining, uh, gaining traction and success in communities um, typically excluded from the financial system. One example of our technology being used for financial inclusion is being led by Kiva in Sierra Leone. Kiva is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that allows people to lend money via the internet to low-income low entrepreneurs and students in over 80 countries. Kiva's mission is to connect people through lending um, to alleviate poverty. In Sierra Leone, millions of citizens do not have formal identification and hence cannot access financial services. For example, people in Sierra Leone who want to open a bank account might be asked to bring utility bills or information on their credit history, which they may not have. Kiva is working with the National Civil Registration Authority in Sierra Leone to establish an eKYC, or e-Know Your Customer Identity Platform. They can enable in two seconds a KYC check to happen, which would normally have taken two weeks. A credit check can happen in real time in a way that allows the consumer to be in control of what information is shared and allows the bank to get a complete and an un unaltered version of his or her credit history. The effort to create a digital identity, gather and store an individual's transactional information in a secure and tamper-proof environment, provide transparency to the stored information, and create a credit history will dramatically increase access to capital at reduced costs. Another example closer to home is with the city of Austin, who also wanted to tackle a similar problem amongst the homeless population in the city. A widespread fragmentation of health data is exacerbated in individuals who use emergency services frequently while lacking the IDs necessary for threading their history together. This is a common occurrence among the homeless population. So the city of Austin developed a pilot project called MyPass, which is a blockchain-enabled platform that facilitates resident access to vital social and health services um, by digitizing their identification and other key records. They started off small to see how it could work and are looking to expand it currently. In a case study by GovLoop.com, they state that the principles underlying MyPass have obvious public sector applications, coordinating services for refugees or those displaced by natural disaster, for example. Given the Hyperledger community's activities in financial inclusion, we support this effort in modernizing the IDNYC card in a way that helps those who want to seek expanded services. While ID IDNYC isn't using the technology as advanced as what I cite in my examples, it is a worthwhile initiative on further inclusion for the city to provide its citizens with an identification alternative um, that provides ex increased access to city services and financial services. The IDNYC proposal to host and execute a banking access feature on a dual interface smart chip card is a first step in leveraging known and privacy preserving technology for financial inclusion. Without storing personal identification information, it would provide New Yorkers with an option that facilitates interaction with financial services, access to financial enabling services, and greater protection from predatory fees and practices which can cripple a vulnerable population without much wiggle room uh, for surprise costs. It could allow them to participate in a system that others benefit from that has typically not cared to see un or underbanked populations as potential customers. The opt-in feature for the smart chip gives people the option to leverage those services or not, but having the City of New York offer that capability is an option that can really help these communities connect to the formal financial system and access services and technology that doesn't leave them behind the rest of the population and basic services. Thank you. Thank you. And before you go um, next, the program that you're called, what is it called again? My Path? My Pass by the City of Austin. Okay. Got it, got it, okay, uh, thank you. Yes, please, sorry. Good afternoon, Chairperson and distinguished members of the NYC Council Committee on Immigration. On behalf of Urban Upbound, myself, Bishop Mitchell Taylor, founder and CEO, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to speak about the benefits of adding a smart chip to the New York City ID card. Urban Upbound works to break cycles of poverty in New York City housing authority developments and surrounding low-income areas around the city. 
by providing employment services, financial counseling, income supports, entrepreneurship development, and access to safe and affordable banking. We work with NYCHA residents, and many of whom are unbanked as much as 40 percent. Many NYCHA residents spend in a lifetime, on average, about $40,000 in transaction fees to local check cashes as for purchases of everyday items like groceries, metro cards, as well as paying rent and utility bills. To increase residents' financial cap capabilities, we opened the Urban Upbound Federal Credit Union in 2010 to provide a critical connection to the U.S. financial system. Today, we have over 1,500 members. Last year, the credit union processed 2.5 million in NYCHA rent payments at no cost to community residents, saving them hundreds of thousands in transaction fees. Hence, we are in support of initiatives like the Smart Chip on the NYC ID that will save residents money and restore faith in the U.S. financial system. Our beneficiaries trust the ID system put in place by the city, which has facilitated access to critical programs and services and municipal buildings. When Urban Upbound opened an NYC ID processing center last June, we helped more than 1,200 Queensbridge residents get an ID in less than a month. By adding a smart chip to the NYC ID card, two important things can happen. Firstly, we can quickly scale the number of people who are participating in the US, U.S. financial system. Secondly, we make it easier and less costly for low-income and NYCHA residents to pay bills and conduct financial affairs. For residents who are not trusting of commercial financial institutions, the smart chip would bring a level of confidence so that people do participate in the financial system. In my conclusion, on behalf of Urban Upbound, I want to thank the New York City Council Committee on Immigration for the opportunity to testify. We hope you consider this testimony in your deliberations. We look forward to working closely with you to ensure NYCHA and low-income individuals and families have the resources and opportunities needed to achieve economic prosperity. Thank you both uh, for your testimony today and for offering uh, you know, a broader perspective. Are you, are you open for questions yes. from, from myself? Sure. It's just me right now. Um, thank you. So I think one of, the, one of the first questions that I have in terms of the, um, the kind of positioning for options, and, and I hear that both from a connection to programs that have already been launched, like in Austin, and I'm kind of reading up quickly about what the My Pass initiative looks like. Just tell us a little bit, Ms. Otoni. Uh, is this a is an identification card with financial, or is it really just a financial product that has been uh, kind of tailored for city residents to? What the city of Boston did? Yeah, the city of Boston. It, it, it's different. It was more uh, focused on uh, connecting healthcare records for homeless. Healthcare records. Yeah, because they were accessing emergency services. Got and it. it and, a, and those records are all disparate. And the records are helpful for people. What's the what's the um, uh, the goal and the value of kind of pulling all that together from your perspective from the Linux uh, Foundation? So the advantage would be that instead of you know having some sort of medical history, right? Like anytime you go to a new doctor, um, they receive your medical history, and so therefore can better evaluate what you need what, what um, issues you might be having and, and, and provide better diagnosis. If you don't have that pulled together in, in one place, um, it's, it's like you're going brand new to a new doctor each time who has no background on what you've experienced before and you have to remember to explain every medical intervention or medication Right to that doctor that you've had, so it's the advantage. And you know, these might be in a population where people don't remember or write things down, or you know, I mean, I don't remember the name of the medications I've taken. Right, so um, that's the advantage of it. Thank you for that. And I, I'm just reminding myself, I um, yeah, I have a, a condition myself, and I'm trying to figure out how to get stuff that I got from a doctor a long, long time ago, and. and it's almost impossible, and and I and I hear that there there's value in kind of pulling everything together. How do you speak to folks that have this need to pull things together about risks? What are like the what are the risks to the documents that are pulled together around this? I guess it's a chip as well, right? Chip technology. 
Um, I'm not sure about how if they if they use the chip to, in in the city of Austin example. The, in the Austin program. Yeah. Then how does how does the testimony that you're giving today uh, apply to IDNYC and the conversation that you just kind of sat and, and listened to, and and really are there any concerns that were raised by advocates that help build IDNYC that you are one compelled by or want to address in terms of your knowledge and your experience? Sure. Um, I mean, I think the concerns are all are, are, are relevant. Um, from what I've understood about the program, um, you know, there's uh, the way it's designed is taking into account some of the, those concerns. Um, the fact that it is opt-in, um, you can you can argue that well, then that's creating two different systems, and that's a that's a separate argument. But if someone doesn't want this service. Um, uh, they don't have to have it, um, and so I think having that freedom of choice is 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 relevant. Um, and I think that there's um, a real advantage here to having the city negotiate on behalf of a, a large cohort cohort of population. Um, there's some benefits that would come with using this sort of a chip card or finance financially enabled digital ID um, that you wouldn't get with the other types of debit cards that bank, banks offer. There's further protections that they um, are, are working to make a part of that. Um, you wouldn't need a minimum balance. You wouldn't have overdraft fees. Um, and I think the fact that the city can negotiate is different than these individuals going to banks and getting, they would, you can't have that, um, those same uh, features. Um, as you could with a city who is taking into account what this, these populations might, what, what might be useful, what they might need in terms of financial services. Um, and so I think that benefit is, is something that's worthwhile. Um, from what I understand also as well with the, the way that the chip is designed, um, it, um, it, it would only be, it, first of all, it wouldn't have any personal identifying information. So the concern about um, being able to then extrapolate all kinds of data from that is minimized. Um, and that there's very specific specifications on how that uh, contactless terminal, uh, what they interact with. So it's not like you suddenly, um, can have that card read by anyone anywhere. It would only be readable by certain terminals, right? So it wouldn't be something that anyone could access whatever is on, what, what the balance is, for example, on the card. Got it, so that's like you're kind of commenting on the security stuff and, and how, how it could be um, secure. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mitchell Taylor. Uh, My friends call Bishop. me Bishop. My enemies don't Bishop. call me at all. I'm sorry, Bishop. <laughs> you heard me? Sorry, said, go my ahead. friends call me Bishop, but my enemies don't call me at all. Okay, gotcha. All right. <laughs> then Bishop. We'll no go with problem. Bishop. Um, the, you know, your testimony kind of spoke to options that are uh, available in terms of populations that you represent, including NYCHA residents, mm -hmm. and and um, that really rely on. And and I kind of word, I, I wrote down the word trust. You just heard from advocates about them having serious concerns that they're balancing and are challenging the notion that trust can continue with the card. And so what happens in a world where you have a mix of advocates that are on the ground with you to do this work that you're gonna run into that are gonna be in opposition to this and create a different um, understanding of the card that really attack at probably the most important thing that this card has at this point, which you've laid out very clearly, that this is a card that is built on trust. Mm -hmm. how, does that, how does that reconcile for you in terms of the work that you're trying to do on the ground and building something that maintains that trust? Well, I don't want to diminish the concerns of advocates, especially those that represent the immigrant populations, because obviously there are big concerns about information sharing and things of that nature that may jeopardize one's freedom. But on the other side, I'm representing thousands and thousands of residents that live in public housing, 
that welcome this NYC ID card, that also welcome the opportunity for uh, scalable negotiations with financial institutions and such alike. Um, listen, all of us have credit cards. I have several credit cards. I'm sure you have several credit cards. Uh, we all bank. I want to know about we, we all, we all, all of us that bank are exposed to identity theft of some sort or the other. So that all of us actually in this uh, post-technological age are subject to these things. So when I say these things, identity theft, information, uh, predatory marketing, blah, blah, blah. We all get it. When you enter into the U.S. financial markets, this is part and parcel of what you're going to have to deal with and endure. But I, I think those are unintended consequences, but the benefits here are so bold and so big. And I think that we have enough uh, uh, brain trust on the ground and in the cloud to figure out how to make it secure for our vulnerable communities. They, you know, the, the NYC ID uh, card we had in one of our offices in Long Island City, I couldn't believe, you know, the amount of people that were coming in to get the card. Um, and in the, the times they were coming in to get it. So obviously people want it and people want to use it. So I think that the chip really just gives you an opportunity to aggregate as well. I think people are losing the aggregation part and the scale part. And you're talking about data. Well, when people, well, my dad used to say, if one person speaks, you could easily be ignored. If a thousand people speak, you can't be ignored. So I think that when you aggregate and you, you negotiate on behalf of 100,000 people, the rate is gonna be much cheaper than 10 people advocating on their own behalf or even one person, so. And, are, and how, how are we negotiating that? How would? Uh, is, that, is that you negotiating that on behalf of no, your no, constituents? No, no, no. Or is no, that no, the city? No the developers of the NYC ID and those... That's the city of New York would be taking this data and negotiating on behalf of people. Well, I, I, I don't know if it would be the city of New York per se or their designates or assignees, but someone would... But still within the city of New York would be... Right. Would, be, uh, would have access to that data. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about having access to data. I don't know about those details. I'm just saying that if there's a smart chip that connects people together, and let me use a simple example. If we all use cable, all right, spectrum, right? And say 20,000 people have the smart ID card and they all want to use this same cable network. I think that that's an opportunity to say, okay, we'll, we'll all get it from you if you give it to us at this price point. In my mind, I'm thinking in the aggregate that way. If so I want to head to the, uh, to the administration to kind of give us, give us a little bit more on detail, but I think what you're pointing to is um, stepping outside of the concerns that have been laid out and the positive and the negative um, fall under its own category of power, economic power, and could be set up for communities separate and apart from the IDNYC that we all trust and we all love. There's nobody in this room, I think, that is opposed to it. And if you are, I would love for you to testify and give us that information, but I think we're all in favor of IDNYC. The opportunity that you're speaking to, the Council Member Miller is speaking to, can exist outside of the card. And I think that's the, that's the thing that is on trial today, is that merger of these two concepts that work and should be fought for. And I think that's where, where we're gonna hear from the administration next about what compels us to combine that? And are we ready to do that? With all the questions that are pointing to a lack of confidence with advocates and a question about the impact and the opportunity costs that we're gonna have on trust. And that's what makes this card sing. And I think that's my, my only point, is that that's still the question in the air that I want this hearing to push us forward with. So thank you for your time. Uh, we'd love to be in contact with you, so make sure that you leave all your contact information because we want to keep engaging on in, in this conversation with you. I'm just fine, trust me. <laughs> Good, all right. We'll find you, Bishop. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you all uh, for this incredible, I think, enlightening conversation. I want to invite the administration up to testify next. We have Commissioner Bita Mustofi, uh, Sam Solomon, 
from the mayor's office, uh, and John Paul Farmer from the mayor's office, uh, chief technology officer, Nicole Perry from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Uh, and, and Commissioner, I know that we, um, we're at like three o'clock and this is an important conversation, so thank you for being here today. I will note that I did notice you were not here for the first panel to listen to our public panel. Uh, I think you came in at the end of that. Uh, I know your staff is here, but I think it's important that these conversations where we have important com discussions that, that you're here present for that. Um, as part of the design of this. And so, thank you for being here. I just wanted to note that for the record. And you may begin. Oh wait, you have to get sworn in first. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Chaka and members of the committee. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. I'm joined today by Nicole Perry, Deputy Commissioner of the Office of Financial Empowerment at the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections, Sam Solomon, Deputy Counsel to the Privacy Chief Privacy Officer in the Mayor's Office of Operations and the Mayor's Office of Information Privacy, who has served as the point person in privacy matters on this project, and John Paul Farmer, the City's Chief Technology Officer, who are here to address questions in their respective areas of expertise. Thank you for the invitation to testify on this bill. I welcome the opportunity to discuss the work that the administration has done to explore this project and to explain why the administration opposes the bill as written. The IDNYC program and its partners across the administration initiated the exploration of a smart chip for purposes of financial access several years ago. This was prompted in part by the City Council's directive in the local law that established IDNYC that the administration expand the benefits associated with the card, including at a minimum by promoting acceptance of the card by banks. As I've previously testified before this committee, the city has undertaken significant efforts to this end and has achieved only modest accomplishments. As of today, just 13, though soon to be 14, banks and credit unions have publicly agreed to accept IDNYC as primary identification for account opening, and none have the citywide scale and accessibility. We have heard repeatedly from cardholders that there is continuing interest in facilitating greater financial access and specifically raising challenges cardholders have experienced with banking. Accordingly, we've considered alternative ways to support New Yorkers in need and we elected to explore the use of a smart chip to increase financial access and potential MTA integrations with IDNYC. In summer of 2018, we issued a request for information in collaboration, in collaboration with the Office of the Chief Technology Officer, seeking input from interested parties. We also held meetings with advocates who have worked on IDNYC for years to brief them on this exploration. In late 2018, we issued a notice of intent to enter into negotiations. This did not commit the city to any contracting, but instead permitted us to move ahead with our process of continuing to learn more from potential partners about what might be possible and what kinds of terms we might be able to negotiate for. In brief, throughout the past 15 plus months of active work on this, we've conducted numerous consultations with experts, briefings and meetings and calls with advocates and council staff, and we've consistently taken seriously the feedback that we've received. I want to emphasize that through these endeavors, we've maintained a goal of providing New Yorkers with more options to manage their personal affairs with confidence, autonomy, and dignity. We've learned how challenging it is for so many families to obtain safe, affordable banking services. Too many have lost confidence in traditional options and have been forced to turn to alternative services to manage their finances, which exact high fees from already vulnerable people. Further, those who engage with existing resources have expressed concerns around access, fee transparency, and general education or information. 
the option of a chip-enabled card and associated financial services account could help to expand New Yorkers' options by offering an account that is affordable, that the cardholder can easily access wherever they are, that is insured and includes stringent consumer protections. What's more, the city has sought to ensure this product would include extensive security protections. It is important to understand that a chip-enabled card would be entirely optional. Cardholders could choose whether they want to opt in to receive a card with a chip or whether they would like one without it. Anyone who has any misgivings about holding a chip card could be entirely free to receive one without one, just as the IDMC program exists today. In fact, at this committee's last hearing on this topic on February 11th of this year, Chairman Chaka referred to this opt-in model as a compelling argument in favor of making the option available. First, I note that we currently have, as I said, 13 going on 14 financial partners. Our goal with those partners has been broader education on banking options and increased financial health. The addition of this option would follow that model. We understand that even with an opt-in model, there are many concerns that cardholders may have that may not be sufficiently understood the implications around opting into an account that can be accessed using a smart chip. The concern has been raised that by simply offering the product to cardholders, some cardholders may believe that the city endorses this financial product as risk-free or that the product is subject to the same rules and protections as the IDNYC card program itself. To address this, the city would need to take several measures to ensure that cardholders are informed of all product policies, fees, and privacy policies prior to choosing to receive a, a chip card. First and foremost, we would by contract require certain information to be included in notice documents to customers. We would require the financial provider to make sure that these policies are outlined in clear, understandable, plain language translated into the local Law 30 languages. In addition, we would work with the financial power provider, the Office of Financial Empowerment and Community Partners, to conduct citywide multilingual public education and outreach on an ongoing basis. This would be instrumental in educating cardholders about options, including other options for financial access besides the IDNYC chip-enabled card. We remain in the process of exploring this benefit. Unfortunately, as written, Introduction 1706 would deny New Yorkers the ability to make a choice for themselves and deprive them of an option that could improve their ability to better manage their financial health. That approach represents an unwillingness to engage in the issues and an unwillingness to explore creative and possible solutions to help community members in need, even though a resolution could result in positive benefits for New Yorkers. It further undermines the ability of New Yorkers, including the most vulnerable, to make important and empowered decisions for themselves. In fact, when IDNYC conducted focus groups with underbanked and unbanked individuals this April, the results showed that 85% of the participants were interested in obtaining a smart chip on their IDNYC in order to use it for financial service access, provided they could receive full information on fees, access, and privacy protections, and that 100% of the participants were interested in obtaining a card that they could use to travel on the MTA while recognizing there would be privacy and security questions. Since the launch of the IDNYC program, the city has sought to increase access to financial services to all New Yorkers, particularly low-income New Yorkers. Through partnerships with local banks and credit unions, IDNYC has helped thousands open accounts with their card. The reality is that there's still an immense need for better options. As my colleagues from the Office of Financial Empowerment will explain further, it has estimated that there are hundreds of thousands of, thousands of unbanked and underbanked households in New York City, with more than 11% of households entirely unbanked and over 20% underbanked. Those figures are staggering. Living unbanked in a city like New York adds enormous financial strain to low-income families. Individuals without bank accounts must rely on alternative service providers, such as a cash checking, to manage their money. These providers charge high predatory fees for services, which are unavoidable for those without alternatives. Too many unbanked individuals pay exorbitant fees for check cashing services or other alternatives. 
an unbanked full-time worker would save $41,600 over the course of her career by using a low-cost checking account rather than alternative financial services. These savings could generate up to $360,000 in wealth. We have also learned that fees associated with standard bank accounts drive many low-income individuals away from these services. In focus groups we held, several groups part and participants reported that they had abandoned their financial accounts after being charged a number of unexpected fees. The lack of transparency and inflexibility of these fees seriously damaged trust in financial products. While continuing to expand our partnership with banks and credit unions, the program continues to look for innovative ways to address the problem. We've learned from other cities and communities that any solution must include a fee structure that is transparent, affordable, and flexible to income and vo volatility. We learned the city must work to ensure that individuals are thoroughly informed about the responsibilities and risks of joining financial services. We also recognize that designing a product that places the security of the cardholder at its core represents an opportunity for the city to offer cardholders a consumer-friendly and accessible option with strong protections negotiated by the city. Providing individuals with options for financial access and services that they understand and trust can be a powerful tool to allow families to save, plan for the future, and maintain stability in their lives. Without access to resources, individuals are faced with a multitude of pressures that make it exceedingly difficult to overcome poverty. In our work exploring this option, we have focused in particular, as I said, on access. On a daily basis, many people commute across the city for work, for school, for childcare, or for other responsibilities. The ability to withdraw, deposit, and manage funds at access points around the city can significantly reduce the amount of time and effort required to go about daily activity. With access challenges, daily budgeting and planning of expenses is a major source of anxiety for unbanked and underbanked persons. Planning how much cash you may need on hand can be a, the difference between making it home safely or not. As mentioned, most of IDNYC's existing bank and credit union partners are community-based and have a limited number of branches and access points across the city. A chip-enabled product would offer access points in neighborhoods across the city. Cardholders could manage their funds at their convenience, online, ATMs, neighborhood retail locations, at their place of work or near home. This could substantially alleviate daily pressures of planning and insecurity around access. We also plan to develop a model to grant cardholders the ability to make remittances to family and friends in other countries at lower rates than may currently be available on the market. In addition, the MTA has begun rollout of a contactless payment system that will result in an eventual phase out of the current MetroCard. This system will require all commuters to use a contactless payment vehicle to pay for transit. A chip-enabled IDNYC card can help ensure equitable access to New Yorkers. Several other major cities that adopted a contactless public transit system subsequently experienced an uptick in merchant adoption of cashless systems. We are already seeing many New York stores follow suit. If this trend continues, the burden would again fall most heavily upon unbanked and underbanked residents. Adding a contactless payment chip to the, to the IDNYC card could address this concern by providing equal access to this new system. We've received broad support for integrating MTA transit payments with the IDNYC card. Unbanked and underbanked focus group participants unanimously agreed that they would like to use the card to pay for mass transit, with participants emphasizing that they felt it would ease their ability to use the subways and buses, and one noting that it would save them money by eliminating the difficulties of consolidating multiple metro cards with small balances. I want to give a brief overview of the technology that would be used in the proposed product. Chip-enabled IDNYC cards would include a dual interface, RFID, EMV standard smart chip that supports both insert and contactless transactions. EMV is a global standard for cards equipped with computer chips and outlines requirements for the technology used to authenticate a chip card transaction. These chips are nearly impossible to clone and contain a number of security features. This technology has been broadly adopted in the US, in Europe, and around the world. 
Card holders would make transactions either by inserting their chip into a chip reader terminal or by tapping their card on a point of sale terminal where contactless payments are permitted. For privacy and security reasons, we determined the card would not include a magnetic stripe as most currently do and is common with credit and debit cards today. We have learned that magnetic stripes are highly vulnerable to information theft and duplication and are the source of much credit card theft today, with thieves skimming payment details from a magnetic stripe and using this information to make fraudulent purchases. We have had numerous open and frank discussions with advocates about the security of this proposed technology, and we've learned a great deal from them. In our work with the chief privacy officer, the chief technology officer, and a range of experts, we've worked hard to identify the risks and methods to mitigate them. Advocates have raised concerns about what information might be collected by a financial provider and how this information might be used and with whom it may be shared. Let me first say that the city would not permit any individual level information to be shared, sold, or otherwise disclosed to third parties not involved in providing the financial services to the cardholder unless absolutely required under law. We have been and continue to be extremely clear about the information security requirements we would contractually hold any provider to. Through a contracting process, the city could impose stringent requirements upon a financial services provider to set the terms of its operation of this function, including how it handles privacy and security matters. For example, the city could limit the amount of information being collected and retained to the minimum amount required. We could also require certain security measures to protect against hack, theft, or data breach and require that all access to this information be strictly limited and audited. We could also contractually require the financial provider to notify the city in the event of a subpoena for cardholder information in order to allow the city to attempt to intervene where such notification is not prohibited by law. Through these kinds of contract provisions and others, the city would be able to secure far greater data security protections than may be available in other banking scenarios. We've worked hand in hand with the chief privacy officer and her staff throughout this process in order to ensure that privacy issues are identified, analyzed, and addressed appropriately. We're committed to the highest degree of privacy protections that can be imposed at all stages of the project. That means, again, minimization of data collection, retention, and disclosure to the minimum that is required by law, making sure cardholder data is not bought and sold by marketers, and requiring any contracting party to give the city the opportunity to intervene in response to a subpoena as authorized by law, among other measures. The Chief Privacy Officer has made very clear that the privacy goals of the administration on this project must be to identify risks and to explore and employ methods to mitigate those risks. Working with the CPO and in conversation with experts and advocates, we've understood that while certain risks may be inherently present in this type of technology, those risks can be mitigated by a variety of measures, such as limiting contactlessly transmitted data to only minimum technical specification information, rather than data points such as name, address, or account number, and by imposing requirements to ensure cardholders and the city receive notice if information is requested of their records. In some respects, we've jointly determined that certain technologies would not be appropriate for this kind of initiative. For example, and as I noted, we determined that magnetic stripes and barcode use of unencrypted data was not acceptable. In addition, as with data security issues, the city's role as contracting party in this instance would be immensely valuable, since it provides the government with the ability to interpose mandatory product design elements, as well as comprehensive notice and other privacy protections in the relationship between a cardholder and their financial service provider. Notably, these kinds of heightened security protections beyond the requirements of federal and state law are not generally available to consumers who walk into any bank or credit union branch or a bank branch or who learn of an IDNYC accepting bank from us. This benefit of proceeding by contract to secure these protections for cardholders rather than taking a hands-off approach to any financial partner cannot be understated. It would, be rep it would represent a truly significant reordering of the relationship between financial service providers and their clients, led by the city's privacy-focused example and expertise. 
In our work to learn about what makes a consumer-friendly offering, we've learned from community members how hidden fees, a lack of transparency, or clarity about these fees, and inflexible policies have driven many low-income New Yorkers away from traditional banking products. We know that alternative financial service providers charge unreasonably high fees for services, and that unbanked and underbanked individuals who rely on these services are often targeted by predatory lenders and may fall victim to fraud for which they're not covered by federal protections. We firmly believe that where we are able, we must help advance better options. In partnership with the Office of Financial Empowerment and informed by the focus groups, experts, and conversations with community groups and advocates, we've developed the outlines of a fee structure that would provide low-income individuals with the maximum ability to secure access and manage their money. This would minimize fees overall and entirely eliminate certain kinds of fees that have been expressed as most challenging, such as overdraft fees. I already outlined our requirement that access points be available throughout the city. Cardholders would have to be able to load cash, withdraw money, and manage their accounts for free or at lower reasonable cost, predictable costs where fees are required. Customer service support must be available to support all aspects of account management and fraud resolution. Cardholders must also be able to contact customer service in the language that they speak to ensure that they're able to get the help that they need. We would also require, with no exceptions, that any accounts opened with this project are covered by FDIC insurance and protections against fraud, loss, and theft, just as with any other bank account. We would not permit a financial services provider partner to market any loan products through this program. Perhaps, most importantly, we would require the financial provider to take extensive measures to ensure that cardholders are thoroughly informed about all account policies, fees, data collection, retention and disclosure prior to opting into any payment account and impose certain requirements on the content of related consumer notices. In addition, the city would plan to launch a citywide multilingual as I noted, public education, to make sure that cardholders know about these benefits and implications of opening a SmartChip account and to offer more comprehensive financial education and empowerment programming offers, options. Concerns have been raised about the possibility of contracting with a financial technology company, citing examples of fintechs that have used predatory measures to monetize data, deny access to funds, and exploit consumers. This is simply not the case here. FinTech is a very broad term for many kinds of businesses involving finance in some aspects and technology in others. Any money services business is subject to FinCEN and banking, BSA, Banking Secrecy Act regulations. We have clearly outlined all of our red lines in our negotiations and are confident that in a contracting process with any entity, whether a fintech company, a bank, or any other platform, that the city would be defining by contract the permitted activities with regard to transparency of fees, privacy, and security protections, and other provisions. The city has also indicated our interest in, re in requiring a financial services provider to establish a community reinvestment program. This would mandate that the provider dedicate a percentage of profits to a community reinvestment fund. This fund could be managed by an advisory board of stakeholders to determine the allocation of the fund within parameters to be defined through the contract negotiations, such as for financial health education materials, seed funding for new financial empowerment efforts, and more. I have described here what we are exploring, and we remain in the process of exploring. As you've heard, this project places foremost importance on consumer consent and privacy and security protections. We are committed to exploring whether we can bring crucial services to New Yorkers in a way which, in which any risks can be appropriately mitigated. Importantly, this project could, would create a much needed additional option for financial access and it would empower residents to decide if such an option were right for them. I urge the chair to withdraw introduction 1706. The administration would be happy to continue discussions and collaborative work. In addition, we would be happy to discuss the prospect of codifying parameters of what would be acceptable in this area based on the extensive protections we've been developing and recommending for this initiative and any other considerations the council and other stakeholders may have. Thank you. Turn it. 
Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Menchaca and members of the committee. My name is Nicole Perry, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for the Office of Financial Empowerment at the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, recently renamed the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of DCWP Commissioner Laura Lay Salas regarding Introduction 1706 related to prohibiting a smart chip in the New York City Identity Card. DCWP protects and enhances the daily economic lives of New Yorkers to create thriving communities. Through the work of the Office of Financial Empowerment, we assist New Yorkers with low incomes by developing and offering innovative programs and services to increase access to high quality, low cost financial education and counseling, safe and affordable financial products, and access to income boosting tax credits and savings. DCWP has served more than 55,000 clients through our financial empowerment centers, helping them reduce their debt by $70 million and increase their savings by $5.8 million. DCWP also conducts research and advocates for policy, public policy that furthers its work to support New York City's communities. DCWP is committed to making sure access to safe and affordable financial products is a reality for all New Yorkers, whether through our programs and services such as the Financial Empowerment Centers, our community partnerships, or looking at innovative policies with our colleagues in the administration. From the inception of the IDNYC program, DCWP has worked hand in hand with its sister agencies and the administration to ensure the card could be a vehicle for financial access. In 2014, we partnered with the mayor's office to seek and obtain regulatory guidance, ensuring that the card could be used as a form of identification at banks and credit unions to open new accounts, including New York City Safe Start accounts. In the case of New York City Safe Start accounts, we have collaborated with credit unions and banks to connect New Yorkers to a savings account with no overdraft fees, no or low minimum balance requirements, and no monthly fees provided minimum balances are met. In 2016, with the financial institutions who agreed to accept IDNYC as a primary form of ID, many of which are credit unions, we developed a citywide advertisement campaign educating New Yorkers on their options for banking access through IDNYC. We see exploring IDNYC's ability to provide New Yorkers with a safe and affordable financial product as a continuation of this work that seeks to broaden the available tools, tools for improving financial health. In 2015, DCWP commissioned a study by the Urban Institute using data from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to investigate how many New Yorkers are unbanked or underbanked. A key metric used to measure financial access and an indicator of an individual's financial health. The study found at the time that 11.7% of New York City households did not have a bank account while approximately 25.1% of households were underbanked. The study also showcased that those neighborhoods with the highest rates of unbanked or underbanked also had majority black or Hispanic communities. For these communities, lacking access to safe and affordable financial products has implications on the full range of their financial health impacting their ability to conduct day-to-day -day transactions, save money, guard against unexpected financial emergencies, and connect to safe credit building and asset building products. Today, DCWP released additional information with updated 2017 data from the FDIC revealing only marginal decreases in unbanked and underbanked households of 0.5% and 3.3% respectively. Moreover, the data continues to show that these households are not evenly distributed throughout the city, with communities in the Bronx and Brooklyn having a higher rate of households that are unbanked and underbanked, 
at 49.2% and 33.7% respectively, as opposed to 29.6% in Queens, 27.4% in Manhattan, and 21.6% in Staten Island. These neighborhoods are most often banking deserts or areas with inadequate brick and mortar financial institutions and are often populated by businesses offering high cost alternative financial services, such as pawn brokers, check cashers, or money transfers. The individuals and families who come to rely on alternative financial services face challenges every day in managing and improving their financial health. New Yorkers who lack accounts or transaction cards and rely on check cashers pay more in fees or may be forced to keep their cash in unsafe places. The average worker without a bank account can spend more than $40,000 over the course of their lifetime to cash their paychecks. Every year, New Yorkers across the city spend $225 million in check cashing fees. These are real measures of the amount of money removed from communities who can afford it the least. Furthermore, New York City's unbanked households continue to be highly concentrated in neighborhoods that have higher rates of vulnerable residents who are struggling with other areas of financial health, including no or low credit scores and delinquent debt. We have worked extensively with organizations in these communities, and we have met with New Yorkers in these communities, educating them on the, a range of topics, including the dangers of predatory lending and distressful student loan debt, or promoting DCWP's financial empowerment centers. New Yorkers who do not have the opportunity to access safe financial resources may find that their only option is an expensive or predatory financial product that adversely affects their overall financial health. These products may not be insured by the FDIC or may not have built-in protections for loss, theft, and unauthorized charges. They may charge fees harmful to working families on a tight budget, such as overdraft, insufficient funds, and decline transaction fees. Ultimately, the lack of access to a safe and affordable financial product will have repercussions down the line on the financial health of New Yorkers. Because of these challenges faced by our communities that lack access to affordable or safe financial products, DCWP, DCWP believes it is critically important that the city continues to take the lead, expanding access and protecting consumers from predatory practices. The city of New York, by developing a financial product, can provide a critical service to unbanked and underbanked communities that need more safe and affordable solutions than those offered currently in their communities. We hope the council will reconsider this legislation and continue to partner with the city to improve financial access for more New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you both, and uh, I'm assuming you, both of you are here for support and any questions that we might have. Okay, great. And do you remember- Not just the, moral. What was that? Moral and- I said not just moral. Not just moral, <laughs> yeah. No, we're, we're, we have some substantive stuff um, to add to the moral pieces. Uh, the, you know, we have some prepared questions, and before I start that, I wanna offer a, a kind of um, understanding. And the legislation does a couple things, and I wanna offer the opportunity for your response to this, that there are some points in the testimony, uh, Commissioner Mustofi, that really kind of talked about the unwillingness to engage, and that this essentially, as written, would kind of cut choices for New Yorkers. Uh, I beg to differ, and so I want to offer you the opportunity to respond to this. What we have found in this conversation of multiple, uh, well, not just days, uh, almost like weeks of sitting down in a space and conversation, we still are at this place of disagreement, uh, not just as a city and the council, myself, but with the advocates. And so that's just, that's the truth, and we're trying to get to a point where we can create some common ground. One of the things that has been frustrating for me is this moment uh, that often happens in discussion around the acquisition, uh, the negotiated contract, 
where you are unable to answer questions because you're in a process that legally binds you to information. Is that correct? I'm not sure what specific information you're speaking about. So in general, I don't, I don't there's wanna... stuff that you can't tell us when we have questions about because you're in contract. Is that right? I think you'll have to ask me the specific question for me to be responsive here. And okay, I can't so I'll have my staff give me two questions uh, as you prepare me for that. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make here, Commissioner, is that when we're having conversations that are important to the community about stuff that's, in, that's integrated into the possible contract that you're going to be signing, you get to a, we get to a point where you say, I can't answer that. And we'll give you two questions. I'll have my team give me two questions that you will not be able to answer on the, um, on the record because you're legally bound to not be able to answer that question because you're in a contract. So that's, I mean, if you can answer yes or no, is that, is that truth that in our meetings we get to a point where there's a firewall and discussion about this program and how it can impact our community? Sure. The number one thing that I can think about is who the entities are that have applied, and that is a part of ensuring that there's a, you know, there's no favoritism in the process, that there's no outside intervention while it's going on. I think we've been very open in talking about things that are separate from this process, including technology, right, and very open in talking about what our interests are in what we would see yielded from the process. And I think part of this, as we've said from the outset, is we are engaged in a process that doesn't bind us to do anything. So the whole point of the conversations along the way and the education for us is to allow us to, to in, just do, to do that, just that, right? What are the things that people have greatest concerns over? What are the red lines? But also, what is it that we would want to see realized? And frankly, that hasn't happened in the conversations. And I think from our perspective, we heard clearly the need to in building trust and space to ha engage and have conversations, and we've done that. We've not rushed the process. We've not done anything to signal that we've been in a hurry around it. We've continued and, and expressed a willingness to engage. We actually haven't engaged with a wide array of uh, community-based providers and institutions because we have been in the like learning stages and the process to see really where we're going. So, candidly, I'm not, you know, I think, sure, can we disclose who the entities are? No. Can we at this juncture disclose, ex like, a contract? We don't have one, right? So... <laughs> and that's not one of the questions that I, that I would sure. ask for. But essentially, the specifics on the metrics of what is being negotiated, like fee structures, is not something you can engage with us on. But that's something that you point to that's going to be good. I don't know what that is. Uh, specific privacy measures that you're going to build in, you can't tell me that because you're in negotiation. And so I think what's, what's important here is that there's a firewall with, with the discussion to have a fuller the fuller conversation that I think has been not only frustrating, but not, um, not giving us the full opportunity to join you in this effort. And, and I think that's the, that's the kind of component here that is offering an opportunity to open up the discussion. So let's walk through this bill passing in the future. It passes, 1706 passes, and you are no longer able to move forward with a negotiated contract. What happens then? Do you, do you stop the negotiations? I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Okay, so here's, okay, Commissioner, we're November 15. The bill has passed on the floor of the City Council, making it illegal for you to continue a negotiation around a chip, a smart chip on the IDNYC. What happens to your teams that are working on the negotiated contract? As I said to you earlier, the whole point in, in choosing this procurement process was that at any juncture, certainly this not one anticipated, but at any juncture where we couldn't meet the needs and the goals that we had around this, we could walk away. There was no, there's nothing about this process that binds us to it. That was by choice and by design of the administration and something that we hope has been heard and understood as why we there is consistently still room, right, to engage on these questions and these issues and to put forward what are, what should be and ought to be the goals of the administration in any contract. 
Okay, so that's not the answer to my question. The question is, would you still be in an, would you still be in a negotiated contract after a bill says that you can't be in, in contract to the goal of bringing a chip onto the card? It's, you're, what you're asking me is moot. What I'm saying is if, certainly we have a, a, a request to do this with IDNYC, right? If we cannot do this with IDNYC through this process, it's a moot process, but that's, that could be because of this, it could be because we chose to walk away. No, I'm telling you it's gonna be because of the bill. We're in November, it's passed. Okay, so I don't, you're not answering the question, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer it for you and then we can move forward with a line of questioning. The question that I'm asking here is that you're essentially not be able to move into negotiate or continue the negotiated process, either by you backing out yourself or by us forcing you by legal standards to remove that opportunity and, and, and process. That then opens up the conversation to have fuller and deeper discussions about what everything that on the table could be talked about. And that's what we are seeking because what I've told the deputy mayor and yourself right here and the public is that we want to continue these conversations, but in a space that allows for community to build this up from the ground up, not from the top down. And we're, we have some questions that really kind of highlight that other component of my frustration and I think our eventual retailoring of the policy because you're correct technically this bill gives you the opportunity to create new options what you're coming back to us in, as far as the city of new york and the council in this interpretation of this bill is that now you're wanting to become a financial institution essentially that the city will enter into a contract to offer a financial product which is conceivably different from this idea of access, which is what the advocates are, are kind of pointing to. And there's a lot of issues with privacy that we can talk about. And what we're, what we're saying is, this is a big step, and we're asking you to stop and get out of this negotiated contract that forces this firewall that doesn't need to be there if we're having open and honest conversations about where we wanna go. And I think that's the main point that I want to I want to make. Whether you have a response to that or not, it's up to you. But that's important. That's important to me as a legislator and as the policymaker. And this is one of the issues I think that I find often with the administration that thinks of themselves, you all, as policymakers. We are the policymakers that you execute the policy. And so we are. You're right. Redefining that policy and that effort to confine it to a better place so that we can keep building on trust, which is what this card is based on. So I'll come back and build, build out that, that ultimate argument, but that's important for us, for you to hear today as we move forward. Councilman, do you have questions? Yes. Go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, there are, wow, <clears throat> a plethora of, of questions that We've been mauling over the last few days, and the chair's done a, a fantastic job in really articulating and expressing some of the concerns that our communities bear. And, and um, I'd, I'd like f for you and your team to really be able to speak to that. Um, first of all, speak to the benefits. Um, in speaking to the benefits of this card and, and some of the research and data that you have, that really justifies the work that is being done, the, the, the benefits of these communities. And, and certainly we have concerns, uh, black and brown communities, about their lack of access to not just banking, but savings and wealth. And, and how, if we don't address that now, you know, that we're looking at, at, at net zero wealth as, as we move forward and as we move along. And, and the benefits of that as it also speaking to community reinvestments, what has been done to ensure that that happens. Certainly that is something that we've all worked towards and it had not really manifested itself as of yet. How do we leverage this moving forward in, in, in terms of that? But I'd like to begin with, how do you speak to communities and how do you speak to advocates that have concern? Certainly um, I have concerns about security surveillance, COINTEL, all the things that our communities have experienced um, throughout our history. What makes this different? And, and are we talking about something that we can quantify that is absolutely different and not necessarily something that we have to put on the scale and weigh um, 
the differences and as to whether or not the benefits are, are, are worth it. Can you say as a matter of fact that, you know, our research at the data says that this is, this is the benefits, this is the value, and, and that we are pretty sure that we're safe and uh, accessible and that people aren't going to be violated. Sure. Those are our concerns, and, and can you speak to them, please? Sure, thank you for the question, and um, I'll turn it to my colleagues to jump in if I miss anything. So um, I'd say a couple of things. I think, uh, as Council Member Drum stated, the goal around the initial program has been to increase access, right? To increase access to try to address some of these issues for communities and to do so um, in myriad ways of continued exploration. And by increasing access, the uh, sort of focus was on connecting folks with banking options. And we did not do a deep dive into each and every bank. We did not do a deep dive into each and every credit union in terms of looking at all of the different policies or fee skills that they have because it was, um, uh, we tried, as articulated by my colleague, to work with state and federal regulators to get guidance, to get sort of universal ex uh, acceptance. I think what opened up through that process for us was through surveys with cardholders, through working communities, through uh, outreach that we've done to get feedback around the program, was a sort of consistent flow of there are banking challenges, right, that speak to issues of access broadly and um, issues around financial services and, that are available, the ability for people to use their ID and YC in different ways that they wanted, whether it was to present it for purposes of a transaction or so on and so forth. Um, and so when we began looking at this, we centered the kind of key goals and questions that are uh, articulated and pretty clearly stated in our solicitation around this, which is around fees, and we, we do a fee scale structure there, um, which is around privacy and security um, and issues there and around consumer education. And I think from our perspective, when you're looking at how are you being efficient as an administration, how are you leveraging tools that are existing, and the fact that IDNYC cardholders card have looked to the program as a way to expand their banking options, um, we, were, we have been trying to identify ways to ensure that people can engage in a banking uh, product and services not dissimilar to what you're walking into with an amalgamated or a credit union and opening up an account um, in terms of sort of the privacy and security scheme that would exist there. So as I articulated, looking at providers that are subject to the same privacy and security regulations, but also further contracting around key protections, including notice to the city of a subpoena, which doesn't exist in other financial institutions. So from our perspective in terms of, and also prohibiting certain disclosures, right, unless, man, uh, unless required by law, prohibiting the sale of data and in, 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 uh, private personal data, right, et cetera, all of these pieces which we think go beyond what exists currently if you're using your IDNYC to walk into an institution because we're not looking at those things specifically about them. Um, in terms of increased or unique risk around the IDNYC card use itself, um, we've taken that really seriously. We've called, consulted with a lot of different experts on how you can address some of those uh, risks or concerns. Um, looking at things, as I noted in my testimony, like not including a magnetic stripe, which is actually on most financial services cards that are presented today, because that's actually where increased privacy and security risks have been reported to be the greatest. That's why globally folks, and my colleague um, at the CTO's office can speak more to this, are actually moving towards the use of 
the contactless technology that we're proposing here. Um, additionally, we have looked at the fact that it is the ID card, ways that you ensure protections for the individual. So uh, not actually including on the card your debit card number, which you have on your, or what's called your PAN number, which is what you have on all of your cards. So if I pick up your card today, I see your debit card or your credit card, right? I see your uh, full 16-digit account number. I also see your security code that's on the back, that three or four-digit code. So we, from a design perspective, have determined you can't have the 16-digit number on the card. You can't also have the security code on the card. And when you use it, you have to punch in a, your, uh, your chosen sort of de debit access number. So there's a number of different measures that we are looking to take that would mitigate any additional risks or unique risks that might be presented and in fact, in many ways, would, as I said, could look better or more secure than kind of your traditional um, banking service product. What additional advocates have noted uh, that is around sort of the chip itself, right? The sort of inclusion or existence of the chip itself and any security or uh, additional concerns that that technology raises because it's contactless. As I said, the sort of global financial services system is moving more broadly in this direction because it's been seen as a more secure option for financial services. And what we've been looking at is what are all of the ways that you mitigate or address concerns around use of have the existence, if you will, of a chip. Um, and so that includes encryption, that includes tokenization, in mandating those things, um, and ensuring that it's only readable uh, by, uh, as, as folks testified, um, the certain, the standard, the global standard on transactions. Um, we recognize, and, and this is something we've looked really closely at and talked a lot with a lot of experts around globally and, list, and certainly with the advocates, that you, in very uh, controlled settings, right, with really uh, sophisticated readers, um, what has, in academic studies, you've been able to maybe read off, you've been able maybe to read the chip. And we recognize that's real. We're not minimizing that reality, however unlikely it might be that that's gonna happen sort of on the street or with any regularity. But what we've concluded from that uh, research and understanding is, as I said, um, you, took, you encrypt and tokenize any information that's on it. So what you might pick up is a number. Um, and that number, if somebody has picked it up enough times on enough cards, and you've drawn sort of A to a line from A to B, could point to the fact that you have an IDNYC. Um, so from our perspective and from the research that we've done on these pieces, we do feel like if you are including in the in information that you're providing an individual or cardholder, these are the risks, right? We acknowledge these, these are the risks um, and uh, are clear in ensuring that anybody that chooses to participate in any program, and this should be a best practice widely, right, that the city is looking at and that the privacy officer takes to heart in anything that we do, that New Yorkers no, I, one, this might be a risk presented that you're, you know, while unlikely you could, if, if skimmed, your card could be identified as an IDNYC card. If you choose to go to a third party and open up a financial services account, that comes with its own uh, uh, privacy and security measures. And we would mandate, as I said, that that be in plain language and in many different languages for folks. And, it would be no different than what happens when you walk into an amalgamated or you walk into a credit union account. I'm gonna ask, a, a, and maybe this is where you're gonna be about to hand it over, what are those risks that you understand today um, to be? Sure. Um, Sure. I think I actually articulated them as I was giving the responses. So if you guys want to. Yeah, I just want like a bullet. <laughs> Here are the risks. 
Here are the risks. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak here, uh, Chairman Chaka and Councilmember Miller. Uh, John Paul Farmer, I'm in my fourth month now as, as CTO, and in the mayor's office of the CTO, we work to use technology to improve the lives of New Yorkers. And that means resources, services, and it means connectivity. And there are five principles that we bring to every conversation about any technology, including this one. The first is equity. Are we making sure this, this tool is available to all New Yorkers? Second is performance. Third is affordability. The fourth is privacy. And the fifth is choice. Because we want to make sure that we're giving Is that in priority? It's not priority, no. There are five there principles. There's a priority list? There's no, there's no, there's no list They're of all equal in priority. They're all priorities. That's fair. Yeah. So uh, we, we talk about these publicly, and we use these internally as we work with our colleagues on any, any issue related to technology. So uh, the, the point of risk mitigation, I think, is the right one. Because at the end of the day, uh, I'd be hesitant to call any technology risk-free. But when we compare this technology to the technologies that have come before or the others that are out there on the market today, uh, I can't see anything else that is lower risk than what's being discussed here. So I don't want to dive in too much on the details of IDNYC and the conversations that have happened before I arrived, so I'll let my colleagues speak to that. But I just wanted to put that on when, the record. When did you arrive? Four months ago. Okay. Yeah. And before you hand it off, I still haven't gotten, I got the priority sense of understanding technology. Yeah. You're admitting there is yeah. risk. So great point. And, right, it's, and it's safe. So I think some clarity. What I'll say though is that yeah. I think there's a broader question about who gets to determine what's safe or not and how people are feeling something like this. So we're, we'll come back to that. So, but so I'd like list. to respond to what I think I are can the respond. risks? Yes. So I think it's really important to have clarity about what technology we're actually talking about. And throughout the course of the day, some things have kind of been conflated a little bit, smart chip and RFID. And so specifically, we're talking about an EMV smart chip. So this is industry standard. It's being adopted here in the United States. It's actually uh, already reached higher levels of adoption overseas. This is where the industry is heading. There, there are actually billions of products out there in the marketplace today using this technology. Uh, now, within the, well, what, what is the EMV? It's an uh, NFC. So when you say RFID, yes, that's been around for a long time, for decades. There's essentially a, a close cousin of RFID evolved from it, which is NFC. That's near field communication. And so near field communication is what we talk about when we're saying contactless. Now, the EMV chip, when you're doing inserting it, and as the commissioner correctly pointed out, that's where you actually have a pin that you know. And in a lot of ways, that is more secure than a debit card or, or than a credit card, for instance, where you might simply sign it. So the chip and pin combination, or a swipe, a mag strip with a swipe, exactly. Um, now, the data that's held on this smart chip, this EMV chip, uh, it's encrypted. And one of the things that one of the major um, card companies found is as they switched from the mag stripe to the chip, they saw an 80% reduction in fraud. And so, uh, again, relative to legacy technologies, this is, this is a big improvement. Now, to be clear, I don't think any of us are saying something is foolproof, 100% safe. But we haven't yet found any technology that we would necessarily say that about. So it really does come down to, are the benefits of inclusion, which is a priority of all of us, I believe, and certainly of, of my office and our work to close the digital divide, um, are those benefits, do they outweigh those risks, and are those risks manageable? I think that's what the team here has been doing. And I'll just add one more thing about our focus on the digital divide, because you've heard a lot about the financial divide and about the underbanked and the unbanked. And there's a lot of overlap between the folks who are not connected, the folks who are unbanked and underbanked, and the folks who are lowest income in our communities. And so back to that principle I mentioned, it's the first one I listed, but obviously it's, it's part of that five point package. Uh, at the end of the day, if we're focused on equity, and we want to make sure we're serving all New Yorkers, we're including them in our economy, and including them in the platforms, the digital platforms that allow them to get access to education, to get access to economic opportunity, to engage fully in New York City in the year 2019, then we need to consider the role technology should play, and we need to make sure that as we consider that, we take into account the risks that, that do exist. Okay, I'm gonna come back. You haven't answered the question yet. So here's where you have answered, you said that fraud has gone down, which is different from this has fraudulent capabilities to be, to be fraudulent in some ways. I need you to kind of come in from the other side of the question and send, lay out exactly what the risks are to this chip 
and the program itself connected to IDNYC. So I'll, I'll let Sam answer that because he's more familiar with the program and the conversations that have happened. Okay, that's fair. Okay. What was your name again? Sorry, I didn't, uh, can you just introduce John yourself? John Paul Farmer. John Paul Farmer, nice right, to meet you. okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sam Solomon. I'm Deputy Counsel to the Chief Privacy Officer. Um, I, I think first of all, I think it's important to note here that these conversations about the, identi both the identification of risk and the mitigation methods date back a significant period. Uh, the Chief Privacy Officer has been involved with this process since the very beginning, and we've been working on these questions very closely with Moya, IDNYC, the Chief Technology Officer's office, and others dating back over a year. Um, the risks and the mitigation measures that we've been thinking through um, fall into roughly speaking two categories, and so I'll describe them in that order. First of all, um, there are, as my colleague said, inherent in any technology likely to be some technical risks. With the contactless chip that we're talking about here, uh, the information that pertains to an individual such as the name, the address, the account number, uh, contact information, that information is encrypted at a very high level. That is the information that uh, the commissioner was describing is uh, even if you were to obtain that information as a merchant, it comes, it comes through as an encrypted file. And so that information is not actually readable. It's not uh, something that you could pick up on the street in the way that some people have talked about uh, with a remote reader. What could be read, and this is where the technical risk that's inherent in the technology comes in, what could be read in an unencrypted format are two things. First of all, what's called a unique identifier um, that pertains to the card technical specifications. Um, and so what that is is a effectively like a manufacturer code from the chip. Um, so it displays, typically speaking, for different types of chips, uh, who the manufacturer of the chip was, what type of chip it is, because there's several different types of technical chips, um, and other, other facts such as like when it was manufactured, and who the chip was manufactured for. So it may disclose uh, this is a chip of type five, it was manufactured for Chase Bank. Or this is a chip of type six, it was manufactured for Bank of America. That is one thing that comes through. Um, the other thing that comes through in an unencrypted format when you read one of these chips is the identification of the type of software applications that are loaded onto the chip. Um, as we've talked about in the development of this project dating back over a year, that would be limited for this project to only one software application, which would be the payment application that we've, been we've all been talking about that would allow for financial transactions to occur. So the identification of the payment application would simply be the chip telling the reader, on this chip there exists a payment application that belongs to American Express, Visa, MasterCard, whatever it is, who owns the payment application that's loaded. Those are the two things that could be read in an un unencrypted format. And that is where we have seen a small measure of technical risk. As we've talked through that technical risk, we have planned the several measures that we imagine can mitigate that risk. Um, and I'll talk about those briefly. Um, first of all, uh, we believe it may be possible, and we've explored different methods to uh, suppress or mask or change the unique identifier that we've been talking about. So that, that was the first thing that I spoke about the code that identifies who the chip was produced for, um, the one that might say Chase or Bank of America. Um, if we didn't want that to immediately disclose the program that was involved here, so IDNYC or the New City of New York, it may be possible, um, and, we're, and that's why we're in the process of exploring this with uh, vendors and experts, to suppress that information so that it doesn't show up immediately to the reader. Um, as the commissioner said, if there were a very sophisticated party who is interested in discovering which chips belong to IDNYC and which chips do not belong to IDNYC, um, that individual might, with a sufficient amount of information, looking at what kinds of information were disclosed, might be able to guess that suppressed UIDs refer to an IDNYC in certain circumstances, or that UIDs that refer to a particular set of characters might belong to IDNYC, even if it doesn't say so on the face of it. Um, we believe that the risk that's associated with that simple fact, the disclosure that a card is an IDNYC type card, um, would be a very small risk. Um, but I think it's important that we here acknowledge, and that the, from the Chief Privacy Officer's work, acknowledge that we have identified that risk. Um, and as our Chief Technology Officer noted, 
that is not unique to this project, that there may be some form of risk. Um, that is exactly the kind of thing, in our view, where it's appropriate to provide informed consent to people. Um, and I know the commissioner spoke about a number of different ways that we think we can improve on the existing informed consent processes. Um, Sam, can I ask just on that point? Of course. On the, essentially the identification, not the marker at the front end, but a, hey, there's an IDNYC chip in the vicinity. Are you talking about essentially technology that would allow for a person with high technology ability to walk into a room and be able to say, oh, there are five chips in here. There are five people who have IDNYC in their pocket. Is that what we're talking about? So the, what we've learned um, in our work on this is that the, uh, the type of card that was described, the type of chip that was described here, the near field communications chip, really is readable only, except in very unusual circumstances that's, that have been reproduced by academics and laboratories, only readable up to a very small distance. And that distance, as, we, as we've learned, in, in the industry standard as it's designed, roughly this distance here. So somebody wouldn't be able to walk into a room, to your point, except in maybe very unusual circumstances, which you know, have been produced by some researchers, would not be able to walk into a room and identify who in the room is carrying an IDMYC in their pocket. There may be some scenario in which somebody could read a card and identify that, card, that particular card up, up close as being an IDMYC type of card. I think the additional thing that's important to add on this point is that much in the same way that we worked very hard with you and with others back in 2015 to make sure that IDMYC was adopted broadly so that it wouldn't serve as a scarlet letter in effect, um, in the same way here, we know that simply identifying somebody as the possessor of an IDMYC card does not necessarily indicate that that person is homeless, does not necessarily indicate that person is undocumented, has a criminal record, or any of those things. It would simply identify that that person is a New York City resident who's chosen to, to join the IDMYC program. Again, I'm, I'm really happy that you feel confident about that, but we just heard from a panel uh, earlier today, I think you were in the room, uh, begging to differ about how that is felt in communities, but we'll come back to that. Um, I wanted to ask one more question, then we're going to keep going back and forth. Uh, if you want to jump in with any questions, uh, just let me know. But I think you know, we've, we're discussing the risks here. And I still feel like there's a lot more to talk about and the technicalities of the risks. And what you're saying here, the risks that you're exploring today are really about a ability to crack the seal uh, protection around the card, people who want to access information. And you're saying there's not much information to access. Uh, there's this code in the beginning that you're wanting to randomize, or uh, now I'm putting words in your mouth, so I, please correct me if I'm wrong, or that there are, there's a possibility that someone will know at maybe a really close distance that there's someone is carrying a card. Um, so let's talk about the benefits, because I think there's an assumption here that there's a weighing of risks to benefits. And I want to give you the opportunity to talk about the benefits as well, because I think that's an important part of this discussion as we, as we enter that realm of weighing. And there's an assumption that we're making here that this will increase inclusion. And, and I think that's also important to add. So can you discuss the research of the administration that you've done to support how this initiative will actually broaden financial access? Because I was really in question in the first panel. Sure, I can start and then I'll turn it over to you guys. Um, so I'll start by saying a couple of things. I think um, we, and I know that, you know, th this is probably just a difference of experience, candidly, in terms of uh, kind of how we are each perceiving the sort of need or interest in this. Um, part of that has to go to the fact that we conducted surveys in 2015 and 2016, uh, 2015 of some of card, a mix of cardholders and just New Yorkers, 2016 just cardholders, um, and then in April of this year, un underbanked and unbanked communities um, with a mix of cardholders and not cardholders. Um, across those, those which were the more sort of scientific, if you will, um, forays into uh, sort of this exploration, um, we universally walked away with an interest in New Yorkers seeing efficiencies with the card, right? Uh, an ability to do different things with the card, including... With card 1.0? Sorry? With card 1.0? Is that all call? we'll call 1.0 versus 2.0? Yeah, we're just talking about what like people original would want to do with an IDNYC. 
in theory, like the future yeah. possible yeah, change. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and so that included uh, MTA or transit card is pretty much kind of rising to the top and something that you saw sort of across communities, right? So Sam's point should not be undertaken and I both appreciate and, and um, have heard and am listening to the advocates uh, uh, expression of concern around uh, sort of who and how some th this means for, for immigrant communities. But I think Sam's point is well taken in that from what, we've saw, what we saw both in that survey in terms of New Yorkers who were interested in the program and also New Yorkers who had the program and also New Yorkers who were unbanked or underbanked is a universal interest in looking at increased access, including for banking um, services as well as utilization for an MTA. I have to say, I and the chair knows, I joined the administration in 2014 to help launch IDNYC. I've spent a great deal of time in communities talking about IDNYC and why people are receiving it. We have focused very intentionally on outreach and community engagement around this program as a way to have a feedback loop around both people being able to access it, but also what's working and what isn't. And consistently, and as we started, start every year, we go through a process of looking at what should we be doing with the program, how could we make it more accessible, how could we make it work for more New Yorkers, we, we raise or elevate sort of the things that have been risen to the top um, and what we should be looking at. And without fail, these are the things that come to the top banking challenges and access, interest in having this be, have more utilization or integration specifically with the transit system. So I do appreciate that folks are saying, well, we're not clamoring for this, but I have to say in us doing our job in engaging with New Yorkers more broadly and a cross section of folks that are interested in the program and the diversity of who has engaged with this program and how, people are asking us to keep looking at this. And so that's where Can this- I pause you there? Because I think this is an important point in the conversation that should be addressed, which is um, two things. One is you heard from the first panel that they weren't asked at any point before the RFI to help shape that question, that request for information from the world, and that's concerning. And you're saying, well, we went to the public well, you did go to the public after we asked those questions in April 2019 about where did you get this idea from? And there's a real question about where this concept came from. And what is important that I wanna, I wanna emphasize here is that the way that we, and maybe I'll just speak for myself, but um, shape legislation is from the community. The community really shapes how we think about policy in terms of shaping. And the burden of proof lies on us to prove that we are moving in the good direction. And the community is always the one that's gonna check us. And that check has failed from the organizations and advocates that have been building this card from the very beginning. And so you're saying you're going to the people, but that happened in April of 2019. Even though you do go in 2015 and ask the question, hey, what do you want? And you got some answers here. So here's my question in that conversation that you had with folks in 2015 and maybe even in 2019, did you make them aware of the risks that we're talking about today that lead to uh, concern that the community advocates are telling you about? And did they have all of that information when they're answering your question about, hey, do you want a chip on your card or what do you want on the card? And so that's, that's a, a, I think, an important part of this whole dialogue. So I'll, let me say a couple things about process because you've raised it a couple of times. So. I think um, we, when we started to look at this, we did brief folks. We actually briefed folks before we, we did the CTO challenge, which was very early in us looking at this. Can uh, you give us dates and then how did you brief and what did you brief them on and all that? Sorry? Uh, I don't have the dates off the top of my head. Okay. We briefed folks before that we did we uh, solicited the CTO challenge, which was in the summer of 2018, I believe. And what was the briefing? Um, it was this is the challenge, right? This is what we're thinking of doing. We've we've heard and continue to hear around banking access challenges. We want to see if this is possible. What we've set forth in this challenge is we would be looking for a responder or respondent that 
gives us a fee scale that looks like this, minimum or no fees, right? And we listed out what those were. We would want somebody to look at and address privacy and security considerations. All of, all of the things that we have talked about. We brought folks back in after we reviewed those submissions in August of 2018, I believe, and briefed them on that. Now, I, by no stretch of the imagination, think that anything is perfect in the way that it rolls out or how it rolls out or why it rolls out the way that it does. But we noted to people we were issuing the, uh, the um, request for proposals in the negotiation. Um, we laid out pretty clear things within that in terms of what we were looking for. It has robust language that speaks to fees, that speaks to privacy, that speaks to all these pieces, and said, this is the beginning of a process, it's an exploration, and we want to engage. And I hear you that there's frustration, trust me, on all sides, <laughs> on process, and I think that's, in my mind, something I hope would be curable in terms of ongoing communication and engagement and figuring out how you bring in more voices and we have said consistently and been responsive to those frustrations, we're listening, we're not rushing this. We wanna make sure that if we are to do this, we're getting it right. We have not made final decisions, right? Like that's the whole point of this engagement and this process. So I appreciate that, as I said, no, no, by no stretch am I saying that engagement is perfect or that things happen exactly as you want it to. By no stretch am I saying that that's a failure on one side or not, you know, only, but I am reasserting as we have along the way that we have openness to continuing conversations, that we are still looking at some of these questions. We're still trying to figure out have we sufficiently mitigated? Are we bringing in broader cross-section of voices to make sure we're hearing the good and the bad, right? We are hearing proactively what people want to see out of this if it is to happen, as well as the security and other concerns that they have. New Yorkers that you talk to about this, and the, the surveys are, as I said, one piece of this. It's not the driving and only piece of this, and Deputy Mayor Thompson has spoken to many folks about more broadly his engagement and work around financial access and his interest in this project as something that he has seen happen in different areas uh, where sort of a broader, uh, a larger aggregate group of, of folks are able to come together and negotiate a deal and that he has an interest in the city playing a role in that process, in the city actually saying, we will contractually obligate you to what you're saying, right? You can't have hidden fees for New Yorkers. And that doesn't mean this is the only road to that work, but that also doesn't mean that you don't seriously take this exploration and see, can you mitigate and can you outweigh the benefits from the risks, right? And yes, we might come down with different conclusions, but what we've heard from folks is we don't wanna keep having this conversation. And in our mind is, well, we're not done having the conversation because we've actually only talked to a small amount of people. We haven't actually talked to a large amount of groups. We've actually heard from more New Yorkers that they have interest here than we've heard groups saying they don't. So from the administration's perspective, we should continue to have the conversations before we make decisions. We should continue to make sure we understand and hear the good and the bad, and we are doing our own cost benefit of mitigation of risk and then presenting that to folks, of course, before there's a final decision. Well, Council Member Miller has a question, and the one, the one thing I want to say here is, uh, during that first panel, I asked everybody, are you willing to continue the conversation? And all of them said yes. I'm offering a path that removes the, uh, the firewall and allows us to start from the ground up, that the bill defines the opportunity with the real sense of burden of proof, which is on you all, that you're still not meeting. And so that's, that's the, the bill actually begins the conversation anew and removes this pressure point of a negotiated contract and allows us to have an open space. And I'm with you. 
I want to continue the conversation. This is not the end of the conversation. This is the beginning of a different kind of conversation that allows everybody to be at the table. So that's my commitment to you very publicly, that that's what the legislation does. It does not gonna, it's not going to kill conversation. It's going to begin it anew. And when we're ready to have this chip, we go back to the legislative process and bring it back. That's my point. Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Chair. So um, let me just preface it by, by saying the success of, of um, IDNYC and a number of the programs that had been uh, led by this committee uh, over the years that, that enhance and support the immigrant experience and other marginalized communities um, certainly has been based upon education and engagement. And it has been um, my understanding from sitting here that folks are claiming that, that we're lacking engagement, lacking that education. Um, I, my personal experiences and experiences of my constituents and others is not, is that that is not necessarily the case, right? That I have seen folks who have um, lifted themselves up in, in, in certain areas that they have been able to uh, gain access in certain areas um, because of what I, I deem of the utmost importance is that for communities of color that we understand the rules of engagement. And, and, and that's what we're trying to get to here, that we're understanding really what's going on. The benefits, not just the benefits of it, but, but how do you kind of navigate it, right? And as I said, success, the success of this program is, has been exactly that, right? And they're, they're folks, and so there's an anecdote and a personal story that I, I'd be absolutely remiss if I didn't leave us with. But what I want to, what I want to hear from is, is um, the conversation about opting in and, and opting out. Um, as we would say that, but, but if you could just hold that and, and the relationship too, I know that we now in New York State have enhanced driver's license, which are not mandatory. Um, is there a relation, relation or coll um, correlation between the two? So let me just say, because I, I think it's very appropriate that, so I, I, I have a, a relative who in 2014, 15, um, because of their immigration status, like th that happens often, was 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 forced underground, um, quasi underground, and and um, how helpful um, ID NYC was, right, in, in in doing so. But along with that, it was education. There were other um, initiatives that were very supportive. Council initiatives. Let me say that we're very supportive of who's community citizenship now and all these other dynamics that, that took place. And, and being able to understand those rules of engagement with the, all the support that we have given and agency support and, and, and so forth, um, you know, a few years later, they've come back into the fold, right, and, and navigate that um, uh, immigration status process. Um, and and uh, successfully, and 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 so culminated with this past Monday, they closed on a home, right? And there was some dynamics that disturbed me here, that that say that our mobility, our existence, and and safety are, are like mutually exclusive, right? that we should go on the ground and that we should have less and things should happen and that we should not strive to be better. And I get that the security thing is, 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 is the urgency of the moment, um, but we can walk and chew gum, mm. right? That our communities can continue to grow and progress because if it doesn't happen now, we, we don't have five years, 10 years and, and, and things. So we, we have to be really aggressive in, in making sure that these opportunities are presented um, and taken advantage of in our community. So we need to dialogue with advocates and folks in the community um, and, and, and not scare them on the ground and say that there's a, a, there's a, a quality of life that you came here for 
is waiting for you if we can do these things and if we can get it right. So I'm looking forward to working with everyone to, to, to get it right um, so that we can have that, not just um, uh, sustain a, 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 a um, sustained existence, but a real quality of life and, and upward mobility in our community as we see in other communities. But with that, I, I digress and just want to get to um, the opt-in and opt-out because it seems like a simple uh, narrative, but it, it's been made kind of complicated this morning. So could we, could we someone uh, bring some clarity to that? Sure, thank you. Um, I'll try to touch on a few things. Um, so on the opt-in, opt-out specifically, we made that determination, as I said, based on learnings from conversations with advocates, experts, understanding the technology, feeling, making sure we were confident in, in uh, knowing that there was a risk, even and even if it was minimal, and even if we all acknowledged that it was unlikely that it would result in anything, that the risk was there, that it, uh, that as Sam correctly described, the unique risk being that maybe somebody would be able to, to know who was nefarious that you have an IDNYC card in your wallet. And um, the recognition of that made us feel strongly that we didn't want people to feel like they didn't have a choice, right? That it was really important for us to, as a goal here, right, in being transparent and hoping that a uh, financial services product is transparent for folks, um, that, that included privacy and security risks. And so if I, as a New Yorker, want an ID in my C as it is without that increased risk, even if it's nominal, I should have that choice. Beyond that, and I think this goes to engagement with communities, we've talked to folks around in communities who say, look, I have a bank account, right? I, or I have a debit card, or I have a chip card in my wallet. I use a smartphone, right? I get it, right? <laughs> engaging in the financial services, engaging with a bank, engaging with your phone, with the advent of Venmo and PayPal and Apple Pay, right? New Yorkers as a whole are starting to interface with, with the sort of fast paced um, speed if, at which technology is advancing and which requires a, a recognition that I know that there is a risk in these things. I don't always know what that risk is, right? So, so where a product can be uh, clear and where I can have informed consent, where I can actually understand what I'm reading because it's in my language, right? That has an added value for me. And so even in the surveys, people recognize there's a pri privacy and security risk, but the important piece of it being, will there be transparency? Will there be disclosure in a way that I can understand and I can choose, I can make a decision for myself. So that is sort of central and core for us in terms of the opt-in, opt-out. In terms of broader uh, sort of benefits and what you want to get out of it, that's one. Honestly, that's a repeat of what you hear and understand just in terms of be it hidden fees or uh, non-disclosure of in, uh, privacy or security information, right? Those are big pieces for us that is where we uh, believe that the city actually being the negotiator and having the leverage of over 1.3 million cardholders, right? The city being able to contractually obligate above, both understand what the uh, policies are of the financial service provider, but also contractually obligate around those pieces and include in that transparency on these pieces is a huge benefit for folks. The reason people say, have said, and this is in research that um, uh, experts have conducted, that they l feel good about going to a cash check, check cashing location or what have you is because they see what the fees are. Right, it's not something that's hidden from them or that they're gonna get charged with later. That's hugely important for somebody that's managing a budget really closely, right? Or that doesn't have trust in a system um, that they're engaging with 
and then later sees fees. But simply, what are the mechanics of opting in and opting out? Oh, sorry. I was going to your back, back to your, your question on benefits, <laughs> which I didn't fully answer. So I'll, I'll exhaust opt in and then I'll go um, uh, to benefits. Um, so uh, you could come into the center, right? You can, uh, we would say you have the option of getting a card, and gr granted, we're working this out. This is stuff we want to talk about. So this is early in conversation, <laughs> recognizing we don't have a product or a contract, and that this is what we've been thinking, um, but want feedback and want to be engaged with folks and making sure we, we would get that right, right? So you'd be able to walk in a center and you would have the option to get an IDNYC that is now your current IDNYC, right? It has doesn't have uh, this technology on it. Or if you're interested in banking with your IDNYC, which would be a thing that would be, um, we've been thinking about as sort of the next question, right? Are you interested in banking with your IDNYC? You'd be given a brochure that speaks about how you can bank with your IDNYC. And that includes walking into one of our existing financial partners and presenting it as primary ID. That includes the option of uh, getting a chip, electing to get a chip on your card, and if you are electing to get a chip on your card, here are the uh, disclosures that that we are giving you so that you have informed consent around that, and then you would still have to go to a third party to activate that chip. You'd still have to go to the, to the uh, financial service provider to activate that chip in the same way you'd have to walk into a bank and, and get your bank account. So for us, it's a matter of of presenting or providing uh, the options. We have not worked through the mechanics of all of that, but that's been our thinking of how you would do so in a way that gives New Yorkers an option to bank with their IDNYC that looks like I can walk into my credit union or it looks like I can actually opt in to get a chip and then this is what an account would look like. And I could go online and sign up for that account or call and sign up for that account or what have you. Does that, is that clear? Okay, great. Should I go back to benefits? Well, and, and just to follow the line on the opt-in, opt-out, just sure. so we could just be clear about that piece, the, the conversations around financial um, access to products, and essentially we're talking about a product, uh, they're, they're not simple, they're complex. You add the layers of immigration issues and whatnot. I'm assuming those conversations are going to be happening in those spaces. Like, how do you have that conversation with folks about all the risks? Do you go through all of them? How long is this meeting? And I get that we don't have a solution right now where these are the questions, right? Like, we're not, I'm not asking you to have an answer to that. But they do present some very complicated conversations about privacy, about security, and data-related risks. And these are the hard things that, that we want everybody to understand sure. as we move forward. And, and so how would you manage that kind of education component or begin to understand that? And here's where I really want to come back and underline this whole conversation with this idea that we're not a, we're, well, question mark, are we a bank? The city of New York, are we a bank? And essentially we're offering this pathway and taking on that responsibility and that's where the burden of proof has to be met by us if we're taking on that responsibility. Because there are these other options, and, and so, so, and I'm not sure that we're ready to take that responsibility on right now. And this is why I wanna cool it off, remove that option as an official pathway so we can begin to think about it with you so that we can get people back to the table. And what you're seeing right now is a, is a division of community members that are saying no to the card with a chip. And, and so how, how do you address the education piece in terms of all these pieces that may or may not be happening right now with, you know, I just got a new credit card. I didn't read one thing. And that's on me, right? That's on me. But that's on me. That's on me. And now we're taking that responsibility as a community, as a community, as a government, a municipal government. And, and I, I'm not sure that we're understanding the gravity of that, of that issue when we have community members that are are relying on, on that currency that's not about a dollar or access to financial services, it's trust. And that currency is, is at risk. So I'd say a few things in response to that. Um, we, and I think Council Member Drum did a much more effective job at this than I could, 
we have been saying since with the launch of this program that banking is good for your financial health. We have been saying since the launch of this program that here are banking partners that accept IDNYC for purposes of opening, of you engaging in the financial services space. We have, through the work of the Office of Financial Empowerment, started Safe Start accounts, right, as options to give New Yorkers. The whole purview of this conversation is around creating options and trying to address in the creation of those options ways to surmount challenges people have to banking options and to increased financial health. And what makes it an, 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 what makes it a necessity to build this option with the card? What prevents us, and this is part of this concept of more solutions, to build the solution separate from IDNYC? What's preventing us from creating this option separate from IDNYC? I mean, you asked why did you guys start to do this? I mean, as the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, we help run IDNYC. We have continuously looked for five years at how you increase banking access and financial access with IDNYC as our lens. Got it. So this is like a, a nail. <laughs> this is like a nail and a hammer. So the hammer's only going to see nails, and that's what you're saying is that 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 this is you're kind of in motion by by legislative pursuit. But legislative again, community, my, my as I described, cardholder, as I described. No, it's, right? a, it's a more specific question. Like, I'm asking a different question. Can we create the solution separate and apart from this card? Is there another card? NYC Care, I think, is a different card. This could be a different card. This could be a different option that separates from the thing that we have built together with community. I understand. That is telling us that they will say no. I understand your question, okay. and, I, and I have heard community saying they don't like the idea of the entanglement. I, I hear that. And I, as I said, have said we've not made decisions, right? We've not made final decisions. We're still looking at this. And we have, at this moment, right, not concluded as they have, that the, the, the entanglement, if you will, of an ID program and an increase and a banking option is a negative thing. In fact, the opposite. We have seen, and again, I thought Council Member Drum noted this Correctly, we have seen the ability for the program to increase access and integrations in different ways. We've built an infrastructure within communities. We have a whole system that is producing cards for people, right? And that matters in terms of how people actually get information, in terms of how people engage in services, right? People want efficiencies. Part of the beauty of the program and what we've always actually looked at in terms of destigmatization is how do you continue to make it something that makes sense for all communities, right? And cross-section of communities, including people like me, right, say, well, I would use this as a transit card because I don't necessarily want to just use, like to use my credit card. I actually like the idea as, tra as the transit system is moving towards being contactless having a separate card in my wallet that's not duplicative. I don't have to get a new card, but I have my ID and YC that I could use for those purposes. So not to mention the fact that you have 1.3 million card holders, so you have a, you know, a body or community um, that, you're, that we're able to use for purposes of negotiation. Yeah, and that's clear that that's a driver for yeah. here. It's, like you it's start, important. You start with 1.3 million people, and how juicy is that for a government or a financial institution to start there instead of building one person at a time to create this concept and and um, uh, avenue for informed consent, and like you're starting with a base of fertile, fertile ground, and I think that's part of what is incredibly concerning here that we're that we're taking advantage of, and I, but we're not taking advantage of because you're not say, we're not saying that because it's not you, an opportunity. I because, thought that's because just, you had IDNYC, you must get this right. That's not. In the same way that we go to any, any of our partners, a food bazaar or a city bike, right? The fact that a cross section of New Yorkers across all five boroughs engage in this program is attractive to them. And we use that as a way to negotiate a deal for New Yorkers. I think we're saying the same thing. I think, <laughs> I think we're saying the same thing. Okay. I think but we're, we're coming to different conclusions here about what that actually means here. And, and I think what's interesting, well, you know what, I think, we, we have some more questions, and I know you have benefits pieces, but we, want, we have some other kind of technical components. 
that are really about the surveys that were mentioned in okay. 2015 and 2019. Okay. Um, when you ask a respondent, would using IDNYC as a debit card sound like a good reason to apply for a card, you're not explaining the risks associated with IDNYC as a debit card. And that was essentially the question that we understood you asked people. Uh, that's concerning. In the data that you're offering, as a, we asked the people, and the people said, yes, we want, we want a debit card. The second piece is in 2019 in April, advocate organizations wrote a letter to the administration expressing serious concerns with the smart chip proposal. This was in 2019 of January. And this committee held a hearing in 2019 in February on IDNYC, celebrating the incredible stuff that we all are pointing to, where many of the advocate organizations testified in opposition to the smart card. This survey happened in April 2019, after that hearing, and it sounds to me like there was not a community input in the brainstorming and creating of this proposal. And I mentioned this earlier, and I want you to address that piece because I think that's an important part of this concept of trust that is so integral into this policy-making work. We're not banks. Banks don't have, rely on a whole different kind of apparatus of, of injecting tools and uh, financial products, but that's not what we are. We're government. And so um, we, in the community input and brainstorming that didn't happen and creating the proposal, you waited until after the negotiated acquisition was well underway before you did a deeper dive into whether community members wanted IDNYC 2.0, as we are calling it. I would have expected more robust and thorough research, which is why I'm calling for this point in time, and the law will give us that space to have that conversation and robust to start at the beginning. In April 2019, the survey findings state that after the proposed changes were discussed, almost all participants said that they would apply for it. Findings also state that participants had worries about theft, security, and privacy, and general distrust of the banking institutions. Were those risks associated with a smart chip explained? And how did those, and how did you respond to those concerns when you got them? So I want to draw a clear distinction that I think has been blurred in a lot of these conversations, which is, if you're, what, are you talking about risks associated with engaging with a, fi a financial services uh, account, right? And, and the fi financial scheme, right? And transactions and all of that? Or are you talking about risks associated with using your IDNYC for those purposes? And I think that's an important distinction because we have, uh, as I said, we, we had assumed, maybe falsely, we had, we had assumed there was at least shared alignment that engagement with a financial services account or banking account could help people's financial health, could address some of the challenges that low income and underbanked and unbanked communities have. Um, and so what you're describing in terms of hacking risks or privacy or security risks, with the exception of what Sam just articulated, which, which is actually about the technology that you put on the card and actually not about the account or the uh, service that you're getting, are risks inherent in engaging in a financial system. They're inherent in me walking into a bank today and opening up an account. So from so from our perspective, again, rightly or wrongly, right, there's an assumption that none of us are starting from the place of doing that is bad. And communities know that. They know, people know that. I think we can't be paternalistic in these conversations, right? I recognize and agree there should be more conversations. I have said our goal is more engagement and a, a cross-section of groups and providers. But re the reality is, if you're starting from a base point of recognition that it's better for people who are unbanked and underbanked to engage in the financial s services and banking protections, right, against FDIC insurance, as I talked about, fraud proof, theft proof, all that stuff, um, if, if those are important and you start from that baseline and you recognize that all of that has with it the privacy and security, the hackability, the concerns that you're raising, then what can we do as a city if we're engaging in trying to address some of the key challenges to any banking 
including some of the ones I mentioned, but more like overdraft fees or the targeting of uh, loan can communities with certain loan products, et cetera, can you put in and uh, contract to ensure that the information about those risks and what disclosures are required by law is given to people in a meaningful way and is a part of education and communication that you're doing. And I, I to, to res be responsive to your question around the survey, sure. Like I said, I think we have, for better or worse, been candid and transparent that we're in a continuous learning process on this. We're talking to tons of experts. We're talking to community groups. We're not done with that. A survey was a piece of that, right, to try to, to look at the, these pieces. But even in that, people say, said, expressed, yes, I'm already engaging in banks. Yes, I know there's privacy and security risks. Again, I don't think we should be so paternalistic in the way we look at how communities understand these systems. It's actually the challenge is there's a distrust in the systems. So getting people to engage at all is a bigger challenge and making sure that when they do engage, they get full clarity and understanding of risks and privacy and security and of fees should be the role of government. Hmm. Okay, and I'm glad you're, you're talking about the role of government here because I think that's what is in question here and that's what I think what we need to better define and understand what is our role in this conversation as we engage in financial institution work and actually building a financial tool. And you asked a curl earlier question that you're in motion right now because of the legislative agenda that said, go forth and access, create access points for banks. It's different from we're creating a financial product. And that's why there's so much scrutiny here. And I want you to understand that too, is that I'm holding those two things in different ways. And we're not only holding it in different ways, this bill that we are gonna be speaking to everyone about is gonna help us to redefine the terms of engagement so that we can bring people back to the community, to the table and remove that firewall so we can keep talking about it. And so we're, we're, we're interested in that. And what compels us to do that as representatives of our communities? Well, on September 12, 2019, 45, now what, 65? 60 folks have signed a letter labor, immigrant, civil rights organizations and services and economic justice organizations wrote a letter to us expressing their united opposition to this plan that you talked about, that we were all talking about for now a few hours to add a financial technology tool to IDNYC. And so I take these concerns very seriously. That's why I'm here holding ground the way that I'm doing it. And I'm not only just holding ground, I'm gonna change the ground that we're walking on. And we want to make clear that IDNYC was created with this successful approach from the community, ground up, ground up. And that's not what's happening. And the very groups that helped us make IDNYC a successful program are now saying that if a smart chip is added to the card, they will tell their constituents not to get it. And so now you're gonna be in a world where you're trying to communicate a technology and an opportunity with that in mind, I think that's, that falls, that the, the fertile ground is removed from this possibility, and that's concerning. Right or wrong, we could both decide whether that's right or wrong, but that w is the consequence that we're, that we're facing. And so what still compels you to move forward in that direction? What is your response to the critique voiced by the community leaders that you heard on September? And how do you still want to move forward with this program without addressing that head on? In the way that I'm asking, in the way that I'm, as chair of the Immigration Committee, as your partner in so much stuff, is to remove it as official process, to remove the firewall, and say, let's talk about it. Because we do want to address those issues. But that's not going to happen, because we need to restore trust with the communities that we're going to do this right. Can I respond? Please. Um, I think there should be scrutiny. I think that if there wasn't scrutiny, something would be wrong. Um, I think that that's a whole part or purpose of the way that democracy should work is that there is uh, a response and there's a back and forth and at the end of the day, hopefully that makes you better. I think that the what I have noted and what we have said in terms of the process actually doesn't change that. You can 
we should and can separately talk about what you mean by a firewall and what hasn't been addressed and what could be addressed. Um, let's put that aside, let's have that conversation. I think in terms of a productive path forward, what's concerning about the letter that you articulate is it says a lot of things that are false. It says a lot of things Walk that Walk us through what's false. I understand, Listen, but, but, but I'm just saying, it says a lot of things that are false. And I think a part of that is because we have engaged in open conversations, and a part of that open conversation is brainstorming and throwing out ideas. And we have said we haven't made decisions. We don't have, right? And some of that is twisted and then used, used against in the letter to say this is what we're trying to do. That's not accurate. I think, and I think it's fair to say there's confusion, miscommunication, all of that. As I said, I think ownership on every side and every angle. Um, I think the point is that from our perspective, we are still engaging. And that's, we've not made decisions. There isn't any final anything. And there, the per, there might be perception and optics around that. We hope we can change that with you. Um, we want people to come in proactively and have conversations. There's been an unwillingness to move around the question of using IDNYC or not using IDNYC. We're still interested in hearing that, but we need to hear from more groups too, right? We shouldn't just be engaging with the same four groups. We should, frankly, be engaging with the 60 that you have on that list most of whom we haven't engaged with. We actually haven't talked to them. They were organized by the four groups that were on your first panel. And so I think it's right for us to engage and say, look, this is what we're thinking, right? If you still oppose it, we want to know that. After talking to us or to, and raising with us concerns that you have, that work has to done, be done, and I agree, and it should be done. I agree on communication. So if there's anything that you can do in, in the spirit of communication to tell us what was false in the letter, it would be great. I don't know if you have a copy of it. Do we have a copy of it? We can give you a walk through what that is. That would be great. I don't know if, Sam, you've done that analysis, but it sounds like you have read it. So that would be great to just put it on the record sure. for the committee. I, said, I think we were responsive to some of it, honestly, in the testimony. In the testimony. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Uh, but if there's anything that really kind of pops out as saying this is false, sure. this is part of trying to get to yep. clarity, yep. and that's important here. Yep. Um, the green light New York bill. Yes. So excited that it passed, finally. And while it currently is being litigated, which is unfortunate, uh, let's assume that its implementation moves forward very soon. This bill, for all New Yorkers, regardless of their immigration status, would give them access to driver's licenses or state-issued ID. Super exciting. Yeah. And is the administration considering investing in community education to help New Yorkers access that driver's license or state-issued ID? And would having the state-issued ID help increase financial access to underbanked communities? Sure, thank you for the question. So we supported this. I was engaged on this, as was the mayor. Um, we did op-eds, we did videos, so we are very excited in the celebration of the passage of this law, um, and we know how meaningful it can be for so many families across our city. Um, I think we definitely recognize that it will help address some of these challenges. I actually think, however, in the process of us looking at how you expand banking access here, we were like, oh, right, it's more than just walking into your bank and needing an ID. That's a challenge that needs to be surmounted, but it's one piece of the equation. So other pieces of the equation include, as I said, the transparency, language access. Other pieces of it include the fact that there aren't brick and mortar banks in a lot of the underbank communities. They've left or abandoned those communities. So how do you create access points in uh, across the city at, your uh, different um, ATMs or at different brick and mortar locations or at maybe where you're going to your bodega and do so in a way, again, that makes it more accessible for folks and makes it more inviting for folks. How do you address some of the, the sort of perennial challenges that, that people have around fee transparency or around overdraft fees as being one that has continuously come up for us in conversation and in research? So. Um, while I hope Greenlight, uh, and I'm hopeful that Greenlight helps with this issue, it will cost money for people to get a driver's license. 
it will be uh, more challenging, less accessible than what IDNYC offers, and it might not address these other issues. So we still believe there is and ought to be a role and space for us to be looking at this, um, and that if we didn't, we wouldn't be addressing sort of the broader challenges that unbanked or underbanked communities have. Well, we're also excited about that Great. and listening to or, or watching the litigation. We're gonna, we're gonna join in efforts to get that option available for folks. So there's a couple more questions here. With Deputy Mayor Thompson, he's spoken a lot about the smart chip as a way for communities to generate economic power through buying power. How does that happen without data collection on a, and purchasing of, of information, or the data collection that comes from purchasing? Mm -hmm. Because in your testimony, you said that none of this information will be captured in any way. And you had the second panel talk a little bit about purchasing power that the card would give. And so there's, this is one of those like really hard things to reconcile sure. because either we're collecting data or we're not. Sure. And Deputy Mayor Thompson is very vocal about this in his speeches, that this gives opportunities for communities to come together and, and purchase en masse. And so how do we do that without taking information? Yep. So how do, are you collecting data or are you not collecting data? So thanks for the question. Um, so I'd say, I'll say a couple things and not speak for the deputy mayor. Um, so uh, <laughs> you'll appreciate that. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, more broadly, I think, um, and what he has been excited about it here is that it, um, it is an initiative that mirrors a lot of things he's been able to do in other spaces or uh, taught about or learned about in terms of how you advance um, what he calls economic democracy, um, how you use um, sort of uh, economies of scale to dictate a little bit around uh, either what you're negotiating for or what deal you can get, right? And so. Um, we have gone back and forth and what that can look like with this project, how that can look in a way that doesn't um, compromise the privacy and security considerations um, and that still allows for the centering of those things, but some realization of this broader goal as well. I talked a little bit about that in my testimony. Um, the main initiative, two main initiatives in our mind in, are, include um, the public education uh, um, as a piece of this, broadly on financial health, and this is one option of that. Um, and um, what I noted about uh, community reinvestment, so requiring that after a certain point of profit, a percentage goes to community reinvestment, and having that, again, this is initial thinking on our part, but we put in the testimony what our initial thinking has been, which is, is there an advisory board or stakeholders that determine how that investment goes, is used, um, and how it's used to advance financial health and empowerment for communities? Um, so those are two sort of visions. And we have talked, and I, we talked about our commitment to prohibit the sale of personal information and data, which is a big concern that people have in engagement with any technology, right, or any uh, account that they're opening, either digitally or not. Um, your current bank account, I don't know that I know what my bank does with my information, so you and I need to do some reading on our accounts. Um, but um, that said, uh, we have talked about um, uh, what aggregate data could look like. So if, if you, you know, if everybody, I think, sent the um, uh, folks previously testified to cable bills as like an example, right? If everybody's purchasing a cable bill, can you negotiate something there in terms of a discount for folks in NYCHA housing? Um, I think that's something we're still talking about. So um, it's good so it's to unclear, get feedback. It's unclear whether we're gonna be collecting data or not from the purchasing 
we would, so I, I, I will let Sam jump on this because he's thought a lot about this um, and has dug really deep, but I'll just say clearly, the city would never hold personal information. So just as now you walk into, I don't know, the Met or BAM and you open up an, a, a membership with your IDNYC, the Met or BAM has its, private, its policies that indicate you used an IDNYC to open up an account there, right? Um, and then they tell us one card holder, or two card holders, or three card holders use. They don't it. tell you who. They don't tell us who, they don't tell us how, right? So that is what we're talking about here. We're not, the city would never ask for, would never hold, would prohibit the disclosure of, unless required by law, that personal information and that personal data. Um, and so what we're only talking about is, is there, costs outweigh the risk, right, um, to uh, the aggregate information. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I really have very little to add because I think that was a pretty comprehensive answer, but I think just important to draw the distinction here between uh, individual level data and aggregate data. Um, I think as the commissioner said, as we've looked through the privacy considerations on this, it's the chief privacy officer's advice that individual level data not be shared with the city. Um, and as we all know, and we've gone through rounds of litigation in recent years, there are risks in having that information live with the city. Um, we would advise that we not collect that information at the city level, that it live with the external vendor only, and that the city only seek to receive some level of aggregate data. As we've thought through what that would look like in terms of the aggregate data, and I think we're still interested in hearing people's feedback on what this could look like and what would actually be useful to help design the program, um, we've thought about some considerations such as whether we would want to see that data at the community level, at the borough level in terms of evaluating the uptake of the program, which might help us decide which communities deserve more outreach if they haven't learned about the program yet, for instance. Um, or as the commissioner said, there may be information that's available in an aggregate sense that could help point to particular types of services that people may find useful or may not currently know about but would find useful. I mean, I think in the course of deciding what level of aggregate data would be appropriate for the city to look at, we will continue to work through the privacy considerations with the advice of the chief privacy officer as well. So what I'm hearing is individual data, bad for the city to hold. We're not interested in even considering that. Aggregate data, that's interesting. That can help us with purchasing power and economic democracy or um, economic democracy. And he'll be happy that you used it. I'll let him know. Uh, what? <laughs> I said he'll be happy that you used it. I'll let him know. I know. know. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'll, I'll use it a couple more times before, before I'm done okay, good. Uh, today. What hour exactly in the... Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's on the record. It's on the economic democracy. Yeah. <laughs> and the, here's where the question needs to be asked. The third party that's collecting this data still lives within the third party. And the contract that you're building is essentially to create a firewall around a third party. And that's making me nervous and making a lot of other people nervous. And so there are questions to be asked about the, like the, how, how strong that is. And there's one question that, Sam, you were speaking to in terms of fraud. And that's one kind of category of risk. But there's also a category of federal government coming into a financial institution saying, show me your information. Now, if they come to us, we know how to do that. We've set some insanely high standards. Judicial warrant, single case, active case. Like we have, we built that 2013, 2014 uh, when we passed the law. That doesn't, that doesn't apply to a third party institution. And so if you can adjust that piece, I think that's an important yeah, part of this I'll conversation. I'll start and then Sam, you should definitely jump in. So, um, and I think this is one of the sort of uh, confused um, uh, or confusing, I should say, uh, things that are being talked about. So as I said previously, um, we've heard concerns that a third party wouldn't be subject to federal banking regulations, right? We, we are talking about parties subject to federal banking regulations. So that's important. So, and so what does, that, what does that mean at the end of yeah, the day to my so question? That, so, that, so that's important because I think it, it addresses what are the legal disclosure and non-disclosure requirements for a third party. And that's something that 
we need to know and understand, right? Um, and that's something that should be clear, transparent to a person who's participating in any uh, account, right? Who's choosing to participate, they should know what are their obligations um, legally to disclose or not disclose information. Um, that is, imp that's, uh, I think, the distinction. Um, is that a known set of understanding? In terms of what they are. They are late, uh, yeah. And can you share that with us? Yeah, I mean, we did I, a little again in the testimony in terms of uh, it would not, we are only looking at providers that are subject to those laws, to those, to those federal um, regulations and laws. And that term sort of fintech is so, so broad and so broadly used that it doesn't accurately capture all entities that um, are, it, it captures sort of a broader set of entities than just those that are subject to um, these laws and regulations. So I think that's important, right? Um, secondly, I th uh, as Sam noted and also noted in the testimony, we would seek as the city to impose or extra secure, if you will, through contract, um, those requirements. And that would usurp a federal regulation? It would say, it would say, um, as we have uh, talked with the law department and our contracts experts, right, that the disclosure would only be permitted where it would be required by law, right? So when, and then of course, we would have to fully understand all of the laws where their disclosure is required and that for any financial entity, again, like trying to be clear, let's draw a distinction between what's unique and what's not, any financial, uh, account that you hold uh, is subject to those same disclosure laws, right? And so um, that's one piece of it. I think the second piece is, and we take this very seriously and have experience on this, and actually mirrors a little bit of the thinking that we've done on ID on the program, right? <laughs> is are there um, are there ways for us to contractually obligate? Uh, sort of the, the limiting, if you will, of access and the auditing of that access, which is what we have in the program, right? Are there ways for us uh, to, to contractually obligate notice to us? I think people are most concerned around a subpoena, right? And you can, subpoenas must be particular and must be um, specific, right? For you to have to be responsive to them. So, while we would recognize that any financial services come, any bank, any entity could be subpoenaed, right? We would wanna ensure that they would fight a subpoena that they wouldn't have to comply with. And as a result, we would ask for notice as the city in the event of a subpoena to us and potentially to the individual, right? So that somebody, the city or the individual, could intervene to challenge the subpoena if that was necessary. And again, that's a protection above what exists now, right? You go, my, my, nobody's got my back at my bank, right? <laughs> and so um, that's something that we've been looking at. That's something that we've been thinking through in terms of how do you extra secure taking the learnings from what we've put in place with the program to any um, account that would be this serious um, that a cardholder might engage in. Do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I think just to, um, just to emphasize, I think there are a couple of different aspects of the ways in which we would be securing this information and protecting against those kinds of requests. Um, I think at a very baseline level, um, as we've described, informed consent is really crucial to make sure that people understand where there are actually requirements um, for under the federal banking laws or other, under federal laws um, where information may be disclosed, um, and that's important. Um, we need people to be un to understand those issues, yeah. um, and if they feel uncomfortable with those things, they may elect not to participate. And I just want to understand the, essentially the laws that you're, you're um, the, the conversations pertaining to federal regs and laws. Those laws could change, and so there's a moving target here that I think all of us are anticipating. Anyway, public charge changed is changing, October 15th is on its way. Um, immigration laws are changing, being fueled by a white supremacist president. And so this is, this is part of the, the kind of um, 
concern that people are having. And so this is, this is important. I want to thank you for that walkthrough of, of how you're thinking about it. And I, I don't want to remove that, that sense of urgency that you have slash commitment that has been placed in, in law, on law, through, our, through law, in our original IDNYC. But that's, that's in our house, right? That's NYC municipal government. Now we're connecting to a federal government that is compromised. And so that's, that's important to understand as well. Um, from the perspective of the consumer protection piece, which is uh, the DCWP's um, opinion about making uh, a debit card, how, or how, is, there, is there an opinion that you have about, about making a debit card, about making a debit card? Is there, is there like a, a, a paper that you've written or a, a, a determination or an opinion about about that you you spoke to uh, miss Perry you spoke to a lot of a lot of the need for which no one's going to argue with you here that there's a need for banking in communities for all the reasons that we are all talking about but is there a specific question that your office has answered towards the creation of a debit card or a financial tool from the perspective of your office can we respond just briefly to sure yeah, I think uh, you raise the you raise the notion of the potential for laws to be changed, which of course is possible on any number of topics. Sorry, one more time. You're talking about the federal. Yes. Okay, go ahead. So um, start again. You you, ra you raise this notion of you know the risk of laws changing over time. I th I think the two things that are important to just keep in mind on that front. Number one, that actually I think supports the, the notion that we would want to have contractual protections in place. Um, it would be even more important in that scenario that we have contractual protections to ensure that New Yorkers' information is really secured and kept private according to all of the restrictions that we would want to put in place. Or that notice is required if, if there is a change to an individual, right? So if there is a change that would substantially change or would alter the disclosure requirements of the entity, they would have to give notice to the individual. And, and then second. That's a great like congressional uh, project, right? So that it's not just New Yorkers, it's the entire country should be notified. Absolutely. So this is a great, <laughs> and I'm not a Congress member, but uh, I think that'd be a great topic to talk about with uh, Nidia Velasquez, our Congress member from Brooklyn, who is the chair of the small business and is in the banking committee as well. Anyway, I, I think good the only, point. I think the only other thing to just mention on that is that I, th I think we have been cognizant of the risk of federal law is changing, of course, but that hasn't stopped us from moving forward on a number of progressive fronts. You know, the, the, the fact that federal protections exist and that they could change over time, I think those are things that we need to respond to and be cognizant of. They can't stop us from doing things like healthcare programs because HIPAA might change theoretically someday in the future even though there are no bills pending on that topic. Or census. Or the census. You know, so I think we, we just have to be careful not to overblow concerns here that may not be present at the current time. All right, we're gonna to agree to disagree on that one. Um, there's a question about DAs, the, the, the district attorneys. Have you spoken to the DAs about this? I mean, this is their world, right? We, we should consult with them. In terms of, sorry, and I didn't, I wanted to respond to that, but I also want uh, to give on the financial, the opportunity like the, to the financial risks of fraud and et cetera, We've and, and creating this financial product that's associated with the IDNYC. I mean, the the security partners that we have with the program, and we consult on everything around the program, <laughs> are have been consulted, um, and that includes the DAs have been consulted. No, the, oh, they have that not. includes um, the they have a new name but the fraud protection um, folks at DSS, um, as well as the NYPD, um, have been consulted. Can you consult with the DAs? Sure. Why don't you? Yep. Okay. We're willing to talk to anyone. Good, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then share with us what they say. Sure. So just so I'm clear, you were asking what our office's opinion is on a debit card or a financial product? A financial product that's connected to IDNYC. Like, have you created a perspective? I think a lot of your testimony really spoke to the need, and, and that's right. No one's going to argue with that. Uh, but really what I'm looking for is, is any analysis from your office that's specifically from consumer protection about IDNYC mm -hmm. and this financial product being together, sure. okay. specifically together. 
Thank you for the question. Um, so I think the commissioner has highlighted um, a number of points about um, the city's role and also the city's commitment to ensuring that New Yorkers have options in terms of accessing safe and affordable products. And for our office, we know that access to safe and affordable products is critical to maintaining one's financial health. Um, and so we look at this as another option that's being presented to New Yorkers. When we talked about some of the, a, a number of the panelists mentioned that um, working households can spend $40,000 over their uh, career and lifetime on check cashing fees. Um, I think our office has always been very attuned to how can we keep um, money in the hands of hardworking New Yorkers. Just to give a kind of parallel example, our office oversees the NYC free tax prep program to bring free tax prep preparation services to New Yorkers. Um, since 2015, we've served over 600 and help New Yorkers complete over 660,000 returns um, and saving nearly a million dollars in fees. And that's real and that's important because when we're talking about communities who and individuals who are struggling to make ends meet and are living paycheck to paycheck, that's money that they can have and keep in their pocket. And so the commissioner also highlighted points about why are more New Yorkers not using a bank account or do not have a bank account? Why do we still have 11.2% of New York City households that are unbanked and another 21.8% who are underbanked, meaning they have a bank account, but they can continue to use alternative financial services, so their needs aren't getting met. And we've heard this reason around, or multiple reasons around um, the lack of transparency in fees or fair fees such as overdraft fees. Um, we've also heard reasons around the convenience of financial institutions. Um, the commissioner talked about the accessibility in terms of language um, and then just the f fear of financial institutions. I think what the city is trying to do here and what the city is really looking at is how can we address some of those concerns? How can we help remove some of those barriers? And so playing a role in being able to negotiate um, a product, a safe and affordable product on behalf of New Yorkers. Again, thank you for that. And I, I, I'm not arguing with any of those points that you just made. I think that it's an important piece to reiterate the, the need, and that's what essentially you're, you're doing. What, um, uh, what's important to say is that there are solutions that you're laying out, safe, et cetera, and that's, that's, that's good. The question here is marrying the two things together is the question here. No one's going to, no one's, I, I'm not, I don't think the advocates are saying no to the financial product that you're trying to create, safe, affordable, um, et cetera. Insert the last few hours of conversation. The question is marrying it with a card that has created turbulence with community members that have had uh, concerns over a while and have not have not um, dissipated those concerns. You have, it's, it hasn't happened yet. And so, so really the question is, can you do some analysis that speaks to the question about marrying those two? Because while you might be addressing some of the concerns and issues in general with the world of financial access for communities that are in need, we're creating another problem, and that's the trust problem. And so that's, that's the question. And, and Moya and, and team are, are working on that, but this is just more of a question for you. And have your, has your team separately and apart answered that question? That, that essentially there's a weighing of this concept of lack of trust that will happen from community members and organizations that have been a, the, 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 the architects of this program for a while. And does that play into not just creating a good financial product, but a community that's going to reject it? I'll start and I'll turn it over to the commissioner. I think um, one of the things that the commissioner mentioned in her comments and her testimony um, is the engagement with different organizations and continuing to engage with different community-based organizations around um, the, the role that this product can play in helping meet the needs of their uh, residents. Um, you heard from, on another panel, uh, from um, Doc, uh, Bishop Taylor um, around uh, what uh, 
role such a product could play in uh, his community. So I think there is still an opportunity to talk to community members, talk to um, community-based organizations, and continue to engage with them. I think the commissioner also mentioned the opportunity to continue to engage with the organizations um, that have expressed concern about this product and to really um, understand and identify where there are common grounds and how um, this really could be a benefit for New Yorkers. Okay. Well, um, we're going to go to our last panel. Before you go, though, I think what's, what's important here is a couple things. Um, thank you for being here uh, for discussion that is now very public and open, and we all have the same information, and we're all going to keep digesting this information. Uh, I'm so committed to moving forward with this proposal. Uh, when I talk to committee members and speaker and everyone just to ensure that that we have taken everything when we still have one more panel that could change everything you know we're, we're waiting I'm open to conversation and understanding as well but the the one thing I'm I want to make clear about this legislative action that I'm taking I'm not saying no to the conversation I want to reset it and start from the ground up and and the person the essentially the action that will, will be made to move forward is not going to be a, a negotiated contract, which is where we are in status quo. It'll be an act of the council to allow for this to move forward when we're ready. And I don't think that we're ready at this point. And so let's keep talking. Um, and that's the, that's the path that I'm offering here as we move forward so we can bring everyone back to the table as trusted um, partners in this bigger question about financial access to products in a world that we live in with financial complexities and political complexities. Thank you. Okay, so we have, uh, if you are still here, ANHD, Jamie, uh, Alicia from the Lower East Side People's FCU, Nina Dutta, uh, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and Fanta Fofana, Families for Freedom. Thank you for being still staying here in this conversation. Are we having a, a Moya staff member stay? Great, thank you so much for identifying yourself. Yeah, and just make sure that the, the, that the red light is on. Yeah, it's on over okay, here. Okay, great. Uh, you're ready when you, when you are. Okay. Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? Sure. I can go. Okay. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, so I want to talk about the need of the ban of this chip on the IDNYC car. Uh, so my name is Alicia Portada. I'm the Director of Communications and Community Engagement from the Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union. Uh, my credit union is a local nonprofit organization. Uh, we offer affordable uh, and quality financial services. And when I said affordable, I mean real affordable. I, um, you can open an account with us for $25, but also if you want to avoid any monthly maintenance fee, uh, you only need to have $75 on the account, which is different from... I need to change my banking, too. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because we have to be serious about when we talk about affordability here in New York City. Uh, we have branches in East Harlem, Lower East Side, and the North Shore um, area of Staten Island. Uh, we serve over 8,500 8, members, most of them low-income, people of color, immigrants. Um, so I want to say that we don't need more reloadable cards, okay? When we, um, a, a lot of our work is done through a partnership with community organizations that work with these vulnerable communities. And, you know, homeless, immigrants, many undocumented, um, domestic violence victims. Um, and when they reach out to us, uh, they don't ask for, do you guys offer a prepaid card, right? They, they ask us for multilingual trained professionals who can thoroughly answer financial questions. Uh, they ask for physical branches where people can meet and reach trusted credit union representatives. 
Um, they ask for access to quality financial products, including low-cost savings and checking accounts, which help people build assets and leads them to economic security. They ask for access to fair and affordable credit. They also ask for immigrant services, such as I-10 lending. Uh, if we're not familiar with I-10, this is the, uh, the number that the IRS provides to those people who do not have a social security number that are interested in paying taxes, but could also have uh, credit in financial institutions. Um, they ask for DACA loans, international money wiring, etc. But also they ask for acceptance of the IDNYC as a standalone ID to open an account, right? And so when we talk about consumer protections, we, um, the city mentioned that they're gonna be very uh, careful about having a, fun a financial institution that is uh, supported or insured by the FDIC. Um, but we still have a problem because we don't understand how can naturally somebody go from having a prepaid card to a financial uh, a, a savings account, for example, right? I mean, what, what happens, in, happens in the process? We still have concerns. Uh, we mentioned about hidden fees, uh, liability for unauthorized transactions. If somebody uses a debit card or a credit card and, uh, you know, that is, from a financial institution, and they, do, they say that they haven't done that transaction, they are not liable for it, right? They can make a complaint. We said, okay, so if we prove that you didn't make the transaction, you're not liable for it, right? Um, also, um, bank and credit unions are obligated to provide accurate account statements. Uh, we have cannot have overdraft fees, I mean, uh, high overdraft fees charges. Uh, like I mentioned before, no liability for un unauthorized transactions. And if any fees or any rates or any change in our policy, we are obligated to inform all the members of the credit union. Um, but also we know from experience that since we host uh, a free financial counseling program in each of our branches, they are actually funded by the city, that it, only, it also comes from the uh, consequences of people when, when they are being harmed from uh, corporations, that uh, they're being, they have so many fees on it, or they have a high interest rate, and they just accumulated more fees on the interest rate. Uh, that most of the people are feeling um, powerless, and sometimes they give up, and they don't continue because it's just very bureaucratic. It's like a, a, a dead end, right? So we still have concerns about that. So I, we don't understand why sacrifice the confidence of this car um, among those that really need it uh, by offering um, this extra prepaid op option, a reloadable car option, uh, because there are definitely gonna be some errors and mistakes with this software, uh, because financial institutions, uh, you know, we, we, f we receive um, uh, complaints or we, we receive issues and we have to notify the members and we have to communicate with them successfully. Um, also, partners uh, that come to us, they don't, they feel not comfortable recommending it. And I wanna say very important this again, uh, these are partners like the New Immigrant Community Empowerment that they work with day laborers in Queens, uh, Mixteca. Uh, they work with the vulnerable community uh, in Sunset Park, for example, that they do a lot of this organizing, education, empowering work for us, and they don't feel comfortable uh, referring people to an, an, a car that could be, have security concerns. Um, so some of the things that uh, we thought about is, so what we can do, um, we, we, don't, we think that it's a mistake to pair the IDNYC with a chip. Um, we can work with banks on getting this ID accepted more broadly and allow people to choose the institution that they, they're of their choice. Uh, and do not provide, not promote one specific financial institution, right? Uh, and it, if the city partners with a bank that is backed by the FDIC, again, how do we ensure the natural step from having prepaid cards to having an account? 
because what I see in the, in the field is people, for example, who have I-10 and, and they go to a financial institution, a commercial financial institution, they're not offered necessarily a bank account, but rather prepaid cards or you know products that are secondary from that they don't help you to build assets. Um, so then also um, I want to say that we have reported to the to the city um, hundreds of accounts that we opened with the uh, with the ID and YC card, um, and we are already very flexible. I mean, we accept passports. Uh, we accept um, the consular IDs mm -hmm. to open accounts. So we think that the impact could have been a lot higher. And our site, for example, our branches are not uh, ID and YC issue uh, centers, right? Like I know all the credit unions are. So we think that the impact is higher. And the thing is that we haven't gotten back the information, the total information on how many accounts in total have been open. I just know that we report to the, to the city this information. Um, banks can do a lot more about serving the communities, uh, specifically now the immigrant communities. Like I mentioned before, we have IT lending that provides, uh, to, allows you to have uh, credit, allows you to borrow for a car, allows you to borrow for a home. And we have success stories about that. And don't, we don't feel that they are more, uh, they are riskier than any other New Yorker. And um, some of the stuff to, that I want to mention is that when we say, oh, but the community want prepaid cards, right? I mean, they, they want that. We have to be very careful because obviously our communities are frustrated because of the perceived lack of access, right, to financial institutions. And um, so actually prepaid cards, reloadable cards are promoted as easy, right, as something that is easy to access and that you don't need a, a bank account to have them. So if you, uh, if you say, well, the community wants them, then you have to be very careful because at the same time, if you tell somebody, hey, I can give you a loan tomorrow, you know, through a loan shark or a payday lender, uh, they're going to be, because of their needs, they're going to be more prone to say, okay, I need this right now, right? But we know from our financial counseling programs that that is not good because the rates are so high and because after you made that decision, getting you back to the financial, you know, to be a bank, it's, a lot, it's 10 times harder. And finally, we just want to say that, um, again, you know, we want to work more with the city and, and we're happy to share our model with bigger banks. Um, to, to get more people integrated into the banking um, industry. Uh, and we, don't, we wouldn't want uh, the city to endorse one specific financial institution over the other ones. We prefer that we work hard on getting people to make the decisions to choose where, where they feel more comfortable. Um, some people have, uh, for example, I brought here my privacy policy, and we have about eight companies that we share our information with. Uh, third parties that we share the information. And uh, I'm sure that banks have a lot more companies to share information with. Not everybody feel comfortable with that. So we should be giving the choice to, the, to each New Yorker to decide where they open an account. Thank you for that overview. And we want to talk to you more about that, uh, the kind of list of brick and mortar, uh, specifically kind of credit union options that are going to be important for us to talk about because I think everyone's everyone's okay and um, focused on stuff that's available today and now, and you kind of gave a really great overview of how people are connecting today. Um, but I feel like sometimes administration today just said, that doesn't work anymore, and we want to go in another direction. Right. And mm -hmm. in the spirit, in what they presented their spirit to be is giving more opportunities, then we really need to understand the success stories that you've presented. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us today. Good afternoon, good, good evening. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having this hearing. You were on a panel with ANHD a couple years ago around access to banking for immigrant populations, and I really appreciated it. that? I remember that. When so yeah, I was going to chime in, but I figured, yeah. <laughs> um, 
at this hour. I may, I may come off the page, but you have my written testimony. So I'm with the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. Um, we represent about 80 community organizations around the city working on uh, responsible banking, equitable economic development, and affordable housing is in our roots. And our mission is to build power to win affordable housing and thriving equitable neighborhoods for all New Yorkers. We have been, in all of our colleagues who really got the idea NYC off the ground and have been strong supporters of it since its inception. We do think it can be a strong way for people to access banking and have been encouraging banks to accept it as a primary form of identification. I'm not gonna rehash all the security concerns. We signed on to that letter and we read it carefully and we do, we do believe that it's, it's the right argument, so I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, it was a little upset to hear you know, the strong um, rejection of it, but I'd be curious to hear what we're missing. Um, we signed on to it proudly because we agree with all of the security concerns that this card could have. Um, as somebody who has worked with immigrant communities for many, many years, um, it's dear to my heart. And I'm also, again, to come off the page, in terms of access to banking, we know the statistics. We know that the rates of unbanked are higher for low income, much higher for people of color. And I very much applaud the city's efforts to get more people into banking. What's been striking me during this whole conversation, particularly with the city, is just there's no magic bullets to getting people into banking. There's not gonna be one solution, right? This card, the idea, we talk about the flaw, or the frustrations with the card itself in a second, but even if every bank took this card, which they should, that is not gonna get everybody into banking. For the folks that have been working on the ground with people that don't have bank accounts, the numbers are myriad as to why people don't have accounts. You wanna, you wanna check off the easy ones, right? If it's too expensive, make it affordable. If there's no banks like we have in the Bronx and parts of Brooklyn and parts of Queens, right? We need more banks. Banks are closing, they're not opening, right? So we need to address access to banking. We need banks to take this card. The regulators have already said it's okay, and there are regulated banks that are accepting it, credit unions and banks. They all operate under the same regulations. So I, you know, what, what Council Member Chin was saying is like the city could be putting a lot more resources into getting the Chases, the city banks, the larger banks of the city to accept it. That would be an excellent use of resources. I don't see how having a chip is going to do that, and I don't know why we wanna create a whole nother system. The city has actually done some, because there's no one magic bullet, the city itself has done some interesting programs to get people into banking. They had the youth employment program to provide free banking for employed youth. <laughs> they have a direct deposit program to get people into bank accounts you know, without having to pay a monthly fee. They have the safe start account to get people you know, to not have to pay overdraft charges. There's now bank on uh, standards that a lot of banks are adopting to buy low cost, no overdraft accounts. I mean, there's a lot of things that have been happening around the country that I think the city could do. But, but again, the IDNYC already is an accepted form of identification. And in terms of more access to just points of contact, that was another part that was confusing to me. Your bank is on the co-op network, and I believe Citibank actually allows people to access your account yeah. from a Citibank branch. So access points aren't actually, a, for taking out cash, it's not as big as a problem as it used to be before. There's still way too many of the four-fee ATMs that's still an issue, nothing is solved, but we're seeing creative ways. A lot of the smaller banks are on this all-point network. Mm -hmm. Like, my husband's business account is with a bank that's nowhere near where we live anymore, but we can go to the, the CBS across the street and get money out. But you can't do banking at an ATM. So we need more brick and mortar banks, and I don't see how any card is going to solve that. So it's like it's solving a, it's not solving it in the right way. And there's so many risks out there, but those are things that I was thinking about as I was hearing what the city was saying. So I do applaud their effort to want to get people into banking. I don't see how having yet another product out there is going to do it. I think we have some interesting products now and they could be expanded upon, whether it's a credit union or banks that are offering low cost products or ideally fee free. And some of the work that you're doing is incredible, not just opening bank accounts, but providing loans with ITIN numbers is a whole nother level. We work with banks to provide credit building you know, loans. All of, like, we're trying to get more and more banks to adopt better practices to accept passports without needing a visa, right? Banks are not immigration. So we, you know, there's a lot of way, things that banks can be doing to, accept, to increase access. I just don't see how a chip is going to do it. And I don't think I want the city, I know we don't want the city running another prepaid debit card. It just, that's not gonna help people build wealth, build savings, right. access loans, access other financial products, if they have those goals. 
So I'm sure there's some stuff I'm missing on my sheet, but those were can the I, last can actually, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, one last thing. If, sorry. Um, we work a lot around the Community Reinvestment Act. I'd love to talk with you more after that. Um, but banks are obligated to serve their communities equitably under the CRA. So we can be doing more to hold banks to that. And so even to create another CRA fund, it sounded like, for a fintech company. I mean, look, I think fintech should be regulated by the CRA, and they're not. So great. But why don't we hold banks to the obligations that they actually have under the CRA right now? And the city can be a huge force. I heard it a few times from Councilman Drum, from Councilmember Chin about the city deposits. So I just think there's other ways to do it. And I think I would love to work with the city. I do think they want people to have access to it. I don't think they're <laughs> nefarious, but I don't think this is the way to do it. So anyway, thank you. Really good point. And one of the questions that I had, and yeah. I, I think I know the answer to this, but essentially we have the power to create a CRA bank. Uh, the city has a role, right? Do we have a role to approve a bank? Um, you can approve which banks can accept city deposits. That's, city deposits. Yeah, so the city has deposits. Yeah, it's not a CRA, and I could talk to you about why the um, Responsible Banking Act was challenged in the courts because of preemption. But oh. I think we could still do There's probably other ways to, to We have a it. role as a yes. city. And yeah, yeah. let's explore that, I too. To, One yeah. question I have for you before we go to our last um, panelist. Yeah. Sure, and I'll be brief. <laughs> well, and you'll be brief. Well, hold on. I have one. I have one question though. Um, is the city of New York through this law 1.0 IDNYC 1.0? Okay. Is charged with the city of New York is charged with creating access points for banking. Right. What they're doing right now is creating an actual financial product, and is that the same thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Access and point? does yeah. that require a different kind of scrutiny and a different kind of process? Yeah. And and I think that's something that I'm landing in this conversation today was, yeah. is is they're saying, well, you told us to do it, so we're doing it. And we're like, well, we told you to do this, but you're doing this. Right. And, and so how do you understand that in terms of... I don't see how it creates new access points. I think we have... And it depends on what access point you're talking about. If it means to literally take out my money... I don't think we need, sorry. Of course so, we need more so access shoot, points. This is not what people are asking for. I don't know how, I'm trying to answer the question that you're asking, but I don't, I don't think it's the product that people are looking for right now. Or I'm not, and I don't honestly like to, either you're working with what we have and people have access to literally take out money, which we have and can always be expanded on, but that's through like ATM networks. If you're talking about a place to like load a card, that's that's a huge system, and I don't know how you create that. Like I heard Walmart refer reference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think there's like, a lot of folks that want to get involved yeah, in that conversation. That, there's a lot of folks that want to get involved in that conversation. Yeah. And we're limited in the way that we're do, able to do that through this negotiated contract process. And I think that's part of the problem that I personally have yeah. as a chair of the immigration committee. And I think uh, the frustration is shared by others. Yeah. No, I share your frustration. <laughs> I don't know that I answered it quite. We'll Probably, come back to that. But I, chew, just chew on that for a little bit. Um, please finish us off here with your, um, your testimony and, and maybe a question for me. Sure. And, uh, thank you, Chairperson uh, uh, Menchaka and the committee for the opportunity to testify here. I'm here on behalf of the Legal Aid Society. My name is Tashi Lewa, and we're the largest and oldest provider of legal services in the country. Uh, through 26 offices in the city, throughout the, uh, in 26 locations throughout the city with more than 2,000 attorneys and staff. Uh, we provide comprehensive legal services to low-income and uh, indigent families and individuals. So uh, firstly, I'd like to commend the, com the, chair the chairperson and, um, and the committee for holding this hearing today, and we s strongly support this critical bill that's long overdue. We, too, are one of the 65 um, organizations that are part of the, that had signed on to the letter. Uh, the planned integration of IDNYC with financial services through the use of these smart chips are deeply concerning for us. Um, the plans go far beyond, as others have stated, what was originally intended with the IDNYC card uh, to provide safe government uh, photo ID to immigrants. And it, I think it's critical that the City Council understand the dangers that are there for vulnerable New Yorkers. Uh, the proposals have a whole host of risks, and I think others have spoken, other panelists have spoken about this regarding financial surveillance, privacy, without really expanding equitable access to banking. And that's what I'm just going to talk about briefly. I'm not going to repeat, and we agree with what others had stated. 
But on, on the point of access to banking, I mean, I, I, it's difficult to understand how, and I, we heard t testimony earlier from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, I believe, about check cashers and, and, and the challenges that are there. And I'm not sure how this exactly, having a prepaid option addresses that problem of individuals who want to cash checks. Um, there, there is a problem out there. Uh, we testify, I personally testified with this committee and was a joint hearing with the Immigration and Consumer Affairs Committee 2012. And we, we spoke about this um, in depth. This is something that we as an organization are deeply worried about. The number, I mean, there's the unbanked, the underbanked communities are there. The, the challenges still remain, we're still working on them, but this is not the solution that would that's going to ad address this. Linking this card to existing bank accounts of cardholders doesn't expand access to banking. Um, having a prepaid option where you load funds onto a card to use potentially with retailers or with maybe the MTA, that, that's not a real banking option that's being created here. And as far as we understand, there's no line of credit. I think that's sort of off the table um, as far as we understand. In a, and I'm sure the, the chairperson is aware in a whole, whole host of other, um, other jurisdictions and municipalities where there has been a hybrid option. There's been some terrible, confusing, misleading fees involved. I think in Richmond and Oakland, you've got $4 monthly fees. Inactivity fees, I mean, for the client population that we serve, the idea of having an inactivity fee on top of general ATM withdrawal fees. Now, for maybe for us here, it may not be much, but it, for the clients that we serve, these dollar amounts add up, and that's a serious concern. Uh, basically, having a prepaid option will create, a as others have said, a second tier or a second level of service um, and not really provide people equitable access to banking. Uh, lastly, I'm just going to mention the, the talk about an opt-in option that was discussed um, several times earlier. We think it's problematic because it really is, whenever you have IDNYC or a municipal ID card, it really is the city endorsing the product that's behind it. So if you have two separate cards, one with, one with opt-in or one with opt-out, in either sense, the city is backing one particular vendor, whether it's MasterCard, whether it's a bank or a fintech company, and a product. And for our clients, many of them assume that because there's some government entity involved, that there's some trust there which, they, which may lead them to take risks, greater risk than they actually should. So uh, in conclusion, very briefly, we support the passage of the bill. Uh, we think it's critically important, and we think at the same time we support expansion of access to business and other services and integration of services. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for that. And I, I just want to go back to your point about check caching and that this essentially doesn't solve the cash check caching situation. And I think I think that might be true. So I'd like to kind of talk to you a little bit more about that after after the hearing. Uh, or if you have a kind of uh, further analysis about that, because that's one of their biggest issues. It's like, we're going to solve check cashing issues. And I will say that in some of the conversations that I've had with them, they've said, well, here's how you solve it. Just so you understand the rebuttal is for full transparency. What you do is you, when you create this, and we don't even know what this is, right? We're still not even in, mm -hmm. but you create the opportunity for a employer to be able to do a direct deposit to this, this fintech thing, and therefore you bypass the, the cash checking thing. Now, I see squirming uh, in the room, and, and essentially that's how you solve it. And you, you save the fee, and the $40,000 a year that people are saving and uh, all this becomes, becomes the, the, the empowerment piece. Respond to that, it's already six, uh, almost six o'clock, this is a five hour hearing, we were not expecting to have. Uh, but it's an important conversation, so we're going to do it. But please respond to that if anybody has a response beyond the squirming. Chances are, if you're an undocumented immigrant, you're not going to have an employer that can offer you direct deposit. It's not 100%. It's ah. not 100%, but the chance. So I have, a, I have a privilege at the city of New York that I have a direct deposit. Privilege that you have a direct deposit. Okay. And honestly, for anybody that does have the privilege of direct deposit, most banks don't charge you a monthly fee. You can talk about overdrafts later. We can talk about all that. But there's a ton of, like, if you'd like to know, there's a ton of options out there if you have direct deposit. That's why the city's direct deposit program is really good. Uh -huh. So I actually, I, I applaud those programs to help people get into, you know, products without monthly fees. I won't say free because of overdraft. But 
if you don't have that option, you still need to cash a check. And I don't know how they're going to put in a system, is it of ATMs where you can deposit checks? Like most ATMs don't accept checks, they, unless it's a bank ATM. Right. So I don't, I honestly don't see how this, how a prepaid debit card that relies on direct deposit, we have those already, they exist. They, and I'm not, you know, some of them are good, some are not, it's fine, you can look at each product, but I don't see how this system, am I missing something? No, I just want to add very briefly, I mean, the, the reason why people go to check caches and why they're more prevalent than, you know, McDonald's and Burger King combined, you see them in every corner, is not, Part of it has to do, yes, with inability to access banking. Part of it has to do with bank policies, right? You deposit a check on Thursday, you have to wait till Tuesday till it goes through. If you're living, if you got a zero balance, you got a $36 fee if your you know, balance goes below zero. And that's why a lot of people, I think for somebody stated earlier as well, that the amounts are very clear. You look up on the board, you get a specific dollar amount. So, so people who are already partaking in these direct deposit options to their bank accounts, uh, they're not necessarily people who go to check cashing. There's, there's studies out there that show like 40 to 50 percent of people who go to check cashers, they have bank accounts, right? It's just, it's just the confusion that's involved with the entire process, the simplicity of the process yeah. that, that attracts them. Uh, and I want to say something that, yes, we are privileged to have the direct deposit. Uh, a lot of the, of the population, like uh, day laborers, domestic workers, they don't get paid like that. Um, and this, this is confusing because this was the intention to get the IDNYC for those people, for those communities to start using <laughs> this car to get access to financial institutions. Thank you for that. Just take the card. It's a regu It's an accepted <laughs> form of ID. Like every, I don't understand. Okay, there's a lot of questions, yeah. and and uh, we're we're ending with a lot of questions. But I think that I've learned a lot, and I want to thank you for staying this long thank in you. this now uh, five-hour hearing, and say that I am not an expert in this and. Part of what a public hearing does is to bring light to questions that we have as a community. This is government. At the end of the day, we are not a banking institution. We're not a private corporation. We are government. And our currency, at the end of the day, isn't just policy that we have to kind of bring and promulgate out into the world through our city agencies. The real currency underlining our work is trust. And that is what is driving me in this conversation is trust. And we heard today from you and from the panels, most of the panels, and the letter that we just got with 60 plus people, and it's probably gonna grow, is that that's, that's the one thing that we cannot lose in this card, and that this card functions for a reason, and that there's still not enough reason for us to marry this concept of this financial product that they are so excited about, to build on top of a 1.3 million person um, pool of people, and, and it begs the question, is this the role of government? And I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that we need to restart this conversation and that the bill that you are supporting will essentially bar them from continuing the negotiated contract and bring us back to square one so we can do that work that they kept saying over and over again, the commissioner said it herself, we haven't done that work. We're still figuring this out. Let's figure it out this way. And this is not just me doing this because I'm doing this, I'm getting a lot of support from the community to make this action, and that means something. Especially not just from any four groups. I think that was a little flippant in the beginning, and I, I, I am in, um, concerned about that because those initial groups, in the, not just in the panel, but the, the groups that came to us with the concerns were some of the most uh, fundamental pillars of the card itself. And that means something to me and, and to the community at large. Uh, questions about profiling and surveillance are real uh, in general, not just in this card question, and we, we are taking that seriously. And that at the end of the day, solutions can emerge, but they have to emerge from a community-led a community-led process. That's what I'm concerned about. That's what I'm excited about. That's what I will continue to advocate. So continue to join us in this conversation. It's not going to end at all. In fact, it's going to begin anew. And get to your council member. Get them to support this. Get them to get onto the bill. Let's pass this legislation. Get back to the rooms and talk about solutions. With that said, thank you so much. And this hearing is over. Okay, you have extra? Yes, take, don't make me turn. Okay. <laughs>